recording now. So we're going to talk about orthotics and prosthetics today. What is the difference between an orthotic and a prosthetic? Prosthetic replaces a limb, right? Good. What does the orthotic do? Yeah, provides support or strengthening, right? Good. So those are the major differences between the two. So we're going to start talking about orthotics today. And I know there are a lot of slides here. We're probably going to fly through them because a lot of them are pictures. Um, I wanted to make sure Justin stayed engaged. So orthotic is an external appliance worn to restrict or assist with motion or to transfer load from one area to another, right? We used to call these braces and you'll still have PTs that call them braces out there. We need to get a brace. We need to get this kind of brace. We need to get that kind of a brace. The true term should be orthotic. And when you're billing patients, the code for fitting these to patients is orthotic fitting, right? And you know we can fit patients, and there's a lot of times where the PT just orders the orthotic, and we're the ones that have to fit them. And so we have to understand, you know, what the correct biomechanical alignment is. We have to make sure if we, we have a deformity, that device is actually correcting or accommodating for that deformity, and then supporting the injury area, right? So why might PT order orthotics? Well, to relieve pain. What kind of orthotic might you see that'll help relieve pain? Justin might know a few of these. Splints, good. Yeah, right, an ankle support. Uh, LSO, right, for the low back. Any of those can help relieve pain. And then again, here we go to Justin again, to limit motion, right? Especially after he's had a traumatic injury to that ankle, we may wanna put something to immobilize it. But we've learned, we used to immobilize for a long periods of time, but we've learned now, the longer we immobilize an area, right, the weaker that area is gonna become. So we wanna make sure that the immobilization is for as short a period as possible, right? We may do compression, right? On fracture management, something to that effect. Kinesthetic reminder, um, I'm technically, Mike, yeah, I mean, they would technically be considered orthotics. Um, even, even something like Tetho's could theoretically be argued that it's an orthotic. Uh, they usually classify more into just classical DME but they definitely could, you could argue that they're orthotics, right? Because they're there to provide a mechanical support to the limb that, you know, right now that maybe the limb doesn't have proper, you know, uh, lymphatic drainage, so they're there. Keep that shooting arm warm, exactly, right? Uh, kinesthetic reminder to avoid certain movements. A lot of times, especially with scoliosis or something like that, to keep them from bending certain ways or a jewet brace. Um, correct deformities, relieve symptoms of disease by supporting this, assisting the muscular neuroskeletal system, reduce axial loading when it comes to the head, or just to improve general function, right? Assist in movement, reduce muscle tone. So if somebody's spastic, we may have put them in an orthotic in order to calm down that spasticity, uh, protect against further injury, provide proprioceptive feedback, or just provide rest, right? Is a sling an orthotic? Let's ask that. Yeah, right? And we're not putting a sling on a patient because it repairs their wound or repairs their shoulder injury, right? That sling is on them to stop them and provide rest to that shoulder joint so they don't further injure it. So when we're looking at the design characteristics of orthotics, we gotta look at the weight of an orthosis, right? How many of you got, have ever had the, one of those big bulky casts? Right? Yeah. How much fun are they to move around in? Tons of fun, right? You really feel good after getting them off because your arm feels like 30,000 pounds lighter. Your leg feels 30,000 pounds lighter, right? We've come a long way. Orthotics used to weigh literally a ton. When you think of those old casts, they weighed just like bricks. The casts nowadays are a lot lighter than they used to be. Are they adjustable? That's important because we want adjustability, especially when we're talking about kids. Um, what's their functional uses, right? How do they, how does everything go most with everything? Cost, durability, material, everything like that, especially with durability and material is important with kids because kids literally destroy orthotics. They just do. Um, I always love it when 
a patient or a kid comes in with an orthotic one week and comes back the next week and they're like, it's broken. How did you break a titanium brace? I don't know. It just is impressive the things that kids can actually kind of do with it, right? That's fantastic. <laughs> so Alex was using his hammer, his uh, hand as a hammer in a cast. That's great. I mean, it's it's definitely that's definitely uh, I mean, creative use of it. You might as well use what you got, I guess. Um, ability to fit various sizes of the patients, right? With with these braces or with these orthotics, we want to make them as universal as possible because we want to be able to not have to keep as much stock on as possible. Ease of donning and doffing, which is nothing more than putting it on, taking it off. May need access to different trach sites, peg tubes, or other drains. Access to surgical sites for wound care. And aeration of the skin to avoid maceration, right? They, they should be wearing these braces when they're required, but they also need to get these braces off when they're not required to wear them. If a patient is listed as having a brace for out of bed movement, they should really only wear that brace when they're out of bed because usually we're doing that is because if they're in bed with it, they're usually safe enough they don't need it. And the other thing is we need to give that skin a little bit of a break from the brace. So we're gonna look at the duration, right? Well, it's gonna be determined by individual situations, right? In situation where instability is not an issue, recommended use of an orthosis until the patient can tolerate discomfort without an orthosis. So what that's literally saying is we only wanna wear it until the pain is not preventing them from function. So I keep using Justin because Justin's ankle is just, you know, ubiquitous in this case here, right? Um, as far as bracing his ankle, and I, I remember him asking me about this. He was asking if he should wear a brace. Well, if you don't need the brace, don't wear it. If the pain is tolerable and you can walk on that ankle, walk on it. Because again, the longer we wear a brace, the weaker that area becomes. So we want to make sure they only wear it as neat as possible. Uh, for stabilization after surgeries or acute fractures, usually they're going to be wearing from six to 12 weeks. So, you know, a little bit over two months to almost three months. And that can be really annoying. Especially in the case of a patient has got like spinal surgery or something like that. I'll say then probably if looking at the braces, the ones that people wear the least or are least uh, compliant with are probably the spinal braces. They just don't like wearing them for some reason. Um, and then you get that one patient that really loves their spinal cord brace or their spinal brace and won't take it off. So effects of orthosis may lead to decreased pain. It may increase strength because it improves function, uh, increased proprioception, improved posture, correction of spinal curve deformities, protection against spinal instabilities, minimize complications, and assist in healing ligaments and bones. So the drawbacks use, right? Discomfort. Braces aren't meant to be comfortable. Uh, even those casts that you guys wore, right? Those were not made to be comfortable. The goal was to get you out of them. Uh, may cause localized pain, may cause skin breakdown. Definitely nerve compression. A lot of the braces, we have to be careful with that. They will get muscle atrophy with prolonged use. Especially with the chest braces and the, bra the back braces, you'll have decreased pulmonary capacity. Um, you will use more energy with ambulation if you're wearing them. And depending upon the brace, they can be really pain in the butts to get on and take off. Um, so maybe psychological in nature, right? And they may be develop either psychological or physical dependency on it. I've seen this with low back braces. Um, and I'm sure some of you have seen this at the gym with the guys that are obviously not in need of having a, a brace on, but they're still having a brace while they're lifting. Yeah, belt everywhere, right? They're doing wrist curls and they're wearing a belt. I love that. Got to put my weight belt on. I got to make my waist look skinny. Um, it doesn't really, yeah. Wrist straps, wrist straps can be useful when you're lifting really heavy weights. Um, and this is my, again, my personal opinion has nothing to do with, you know, it's, it's you take it for what you will. I prefer not to wear wrist straps and I prefer not to wear a, a weight belt because if I have to wear one of those, I'm lifting heavier than I can. Do you get better gains out of lifting heavier than you can? Yeah, but are you putting it at other areas of your body at greater stress? That's the thing. Right, exactly, right? 
that's the main thing I've always believed is, and again, and most CSCSs will tell you the same thing. Most athletic trainers will tell you the same thing unless they're paid by the brace companies. Um, you know, is that you want to kind of lift with what you can. If your core is not strong enough to bench press 225 pounds, well, maybe work on your core. Yeah, exactly. The rest of these sleeves are strictly for stability of joints. Exactly. It's, they're not made to... Oh, I've seen people wear belts to bench. Trust me. Go to a football locker room once and see how many of them wear belts to bench. Um, it's amazing to see them, and mainly because they just can't not arch their back when they're lifting. And that's the reason they're wearing it. It has nothing to do with the actual strength of lifting the bench up. It has to do with the fact that they cannot arch their back when they're lifting. And so that back brace gives them the proprioceptive input not to arch their back. Right, and then no core as well, right? Um, it's amazing what happens when, you know, especially at the professional level, because again, like I said, my sister has been for about five years dating the physiatrist from Philadelphia Eagles, or actually 10 years now. Um, it's interesting to see the difference an offensive lineman gets when they start doing core strengths. You must be lucky. I've seen it all the time. I don't know. Maybe, you know, maybe we're just going to a different gym and your gym's probably more realistic than mine. Um, but I mean, it's, it's, it is a thing. Does, does that mean you, you're a bad person for wearing a weight belt? No, I'm not saying that. If one of you guys wear a weight belt in here, because I said this before in one of my previous classes, and they're like, Mr. McKeever, but I like wearing a weight belt because I feel it helps me lift my weight better. Fine, whatever. Um, but I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm here to tell you if you need the weight belt to lift, right? Yeah, exactly. Like, Mike, exactly. High school, hundred percent guilty. I was that voice. Though, exactly. Uh, I'm hundred percent guilty when I was playing football, right? Because the trainer came in, tossed the weight belt at me and said, here, it'll help you lift heavier. And the trainer says that you do it. Right. So it's just all those things that happen along with it. Nope, I don't either. But then again, I'm also a fat guy now, so whatever. Um, increased segmental motion at the end of the orthoses can cause problems, right? Poor patient compliance is the main thing. Why do you think, what do you think the number one excuse why patients don't wear their braces are? Okay, you would think it'd be uncomfortable. There it is right there, Russell. You're 100% right. Has nothing, well, lazy is the ultimate answer to it, Alex. Um, you would think uncomfortable would be the number one reason, but the number one reason is I don't like the way it makes me look. That just absolutely blows my mind. They would rather be in pain and not functional. Exactly, just bedazzle it. They'd rather be in pain and unfunctional than wear the brace. Why do you think when we give kids casts, what's one of the things we tell them to do with the cast? Decorate it, right? Have people drawn, have people sign the cast, right? The main reason is it's a psychological component to that, that they're less drawn and paying attention to that, right? When I grew up, you had one color choice for cast, and that was white. And I'm not even talking like nice white, I'm talking it looks like it's filthy white. There is that too. Um, but you know, nowadays there's all kinds of colors you can get it, yellowish white, exactly my kind of look like somebody spilled coffee all over it white. Um, nowadays there's all kinds of things, right? There's pink, there's blue, there's red, there's orange, there's all kinds of things out there to make it a little bit more appealing and a little less kind of embarrassing for kids. Um, benefits, it does improve function, it will save energy in the long run, increase endurance. But the main idea of the orthotic is to increase function without dysfunction. So if the cast is causing more problems than it's helping, or the, the, the orthotic is causing more problems than it's helping, then maybe we need to consider either not using the orthotic or choosing a different orthotic. Um, we may want to provide stability to the joint, designed to be permit safe and effective ambulation by patients, correlate findings of tests and measures, correlate with the patient personally and the impact of the device on the patient, prevent the, deformity, the development of a deformity, 
The orthosis is only one component of the treatment. We've talked about this before, just like with modalities, right? Modalities are great, but they're only one component of physical therapy. We've still got to do other therapy. If a patient is in orthotic, they should be probably in physical therapy. Uh, meet the functional requirements of the patient is kind of important. What do they want? So what happens to PT? The PT is going to come in and evaluate the range of motion, determine their functional state. And then they're going to work with an orthotest. What is an orthotest? What do you think an orthotest is? It's kind of in the name. One who makes orthosis. Yes, good job, Elijah. Right? An orthotest is a specialty, right? And you can get, so once you guys get your PTA license and everything, you can go on to another program that'll help you become an orthotist. Because let me tell you, Elijah's, Elijah's from that, that, that UNR region. Man, you got to watch out for those guys. Um, but there are programs in the area that help you transition from one healthcare position to being an orthotist. Uh, one of my best friends, Brittany Stryker, here in town, she's an OT, but she's also an orthotist. And she primarily helps working with designing orthotics for patient needs, right? Evaluates orthotic accuracy, adequacy, I can speak today, during therapy and contacts the orthotist if repair or change is needed. Now, if we're getting an off the shelf orthotic, you know, an off the shelf, you know, one that you could pick up at a medical supply store, we maybe don't need an orthotist. But if we're designing a back brace or working with neck braces, you know, or custom AFOs, anything like that, we better have an orthotist or somebody trained in orthotics on staff. If you're going to splint, you better be trained in splinting because you can cause more damage than good if you don't know what you're doing. And the patient's got to keep working on proper donning and doffing. So, when we're looking at orthotics, we need to determine two different things. Are they gonna be a temporary orthotic or a permanent orthotic, right? So is it only a short time period or is it going to be permanent? They're gonna to need to wear it forever. And then we need to determine are they static or dynamic, right? Static is gonna be that one that doesn't allow movement. Dynamic is going to allow movement, right? So let's take an AFO for an example, an ankle foot orthosis. If I said I had a temporary static orthosis for the AFO, what would that probably mean at the ankle joint? So a temporary static. Yeah, no movement, right? That ankle's not going nowhere. It's not going to invert. It's not going to evert. It's not going to plantar flex or flex. It is going to be basically frozen in place and usually in about 10 degrees of dorsiflexion. Now, if we say dynamic, well, then we have to just, yeah, it would suck, exactly. We have to decide what type of dynamic movement are we allowing? Are we allowing inversion, eversion? Are we allowing plantar flexion, dorsal flexion? Are we allowing all four motions? And the orthotic is going to be different based upon the motions we allow. I will say that most orthotics for the ankle, we're going to talk about them in a little bit, most of them only allow dorsal flexion, plantar flexion. It's pretty rare that they allow inversion, eversion. And that's mainly if you've got weakness to the ankle, the number one thing you're probably going to be worried about is rolling that ankle. It can be constructed from metal, plastics, leathers. Used to be, so when Mr. McKeever rode dinosaurs to work a long time ago, almost all orthotics were made of leather. Why do you think we've gotten out? Yeah, we got, I got a dynamic one coming up, Mike. Um, why do you think we stopped using leather as an orthotic? We don't care about calcium. What are you talking about? I'm just kidding. Yeah, hot's number one, right? The other thing is, I hate to say it, leather orthotics were expensive. And yeah, there was the animal cruelty thing, but we also have synthetic leathers too, Ian. And they did shrink, yep. And the other problem is, if it got wet, not only did it shrink, but it would just become useless, right? And let's face it, patients, if it's hot, patients are going to sweat, which means it's going to become wet, which means it's going to become nasty. Uh, you know, it, it, just imagine that, you know, you gave a nice leather jacket to your dog to go out and roll around in your yard when it's raining. 
Yeah, like me. That's fun. Exactly, right? Um, better have some good tin on those windows. Uh, thermoplastics are the most common one nowadays. Why do you, so thermoplastics are materials that we can actually adjust, right? So there's a couple different types of thermoplastics. So I'm going to tell you right now, let me find my little annotator here. FYI, I put this slide in there so you understand what they are, but this is not necessarily required for your boards. So there's thermosetting materials. Thermosetting materials can be molded into permanent shape after heating, right? So usually used in conjunction with vacuum forming over modified plaster of the patient's limb. So a lot of times when we got, yeah, thanks. Um, a lot of times with these, we're gonna first of all take a plaster cast of the patient's limb. So if we're working on the ankle, we're gonna take a full plaster cast of that ankle, and then we're gonna mold those thermosetting materials around it. Low temperature thermoplastics can be fabricated easily in hot water or hot air or with scissors. A lot of times OTs and PTs in hand therapy will use these to develop small splints. Have any of you guys seen a PT or an OT designing a splint over the uh, hydrocolator or using the hydrocolator, right? Yeah, those are low temperature thermoplastics, right? The downside to them is even the heat from the patient can adjust the shape of that orthotic. And a skillet, exactly, right? Anything they can use, it's amazing, those that are trained in this. I used to be really good at splints, I'm not so good anymore. But the, the positive side to this, like I said, is they can be kept in the clinic, they can be fashioned pretty quickly. The downside is, let's say you've designed a hand splint for the patient and you're here in Vegas and they leave the hand splint in their car on a July day. What do you think is gonna to happen to that hand splint? If it doesn't become putty, it'll deform, right? And so then they've gotta come back in, they've gotta be reformed. And a lot of times they have a certain limit of how many times those thermoplastics can be molded before they have to be thrown away and redesigned, right? Because again, the more we heat it up and then bend it and then heat it up and bend it and then heat it up and bend it, we're decreasing the plasticity of that plastic and therefore it's gonna eventually break on them. Um, then there's also high temperature thermoplastics. These require high, high temperatures to mold, but they're ideal for high stress activities, right? And included in those high temperature thermoplastics, we also do include carbon fiber. Carbon fiber is not a technical plastic, right? Um, but what is, what is an advantage, what advantages does carbon fiber have to plastics? Does anyone know? other than it looks awesome. It's very light and durable, right? Really super light. It lasts forever, right? And it just is super, super, like it's really hard to break those things. Now the downside to it is carbon fiber orthotics are super duper expensive. Um, and traditionally, you know, insurance companies don't always cover it. But you know, if you ended up needing an orthotic and they said, hey, look, you know, I can get you this high temp plastic, you know, AFO, and it might last you about five years, or you know, that's covered on your insurance, or your insurance will pay 50%. And then for another $300, I can get you this carbon fiber one that'll last 15 years. You may consider the carbon fiber one because that carbon fiber one will last you longer in the long term. And also the carbon fiber has a little bit greater chance to be adjusted later in life than these high temp plastics. The high temp thermoplastics are usually only good for one shaping. Um, and they're also required once they, you have to get it right the first time. If you don't get it right the first time, most of the time it's a waste of the plastic. Go forward. Oh, I'm still on drawing. Uh, metal, stainless steel is common, aluminum alloys, right? They're all adjustable, but they're heavy and they can be used in conjunction with other materials. So a lot of times the metal is not gonna be the main part, but it's gonna be used for the joint components, the uprights, bearings, stuff like that that goes along with it. So it's usually gonna be a combo uh, prosthetic or orthotic. So mainly when we're looking at the strength in it, we're gonna look at why we need it, right? We need to make sure that it's strength. If we have somebody that's 350 pounds plus, those low temp thermoplastics probably aren't gonna be good for an AFO. 
those are probably going to bend it and melt it. You know, how much stiffness do we need? How much do we actually want it to bend? How much do we not want it to bend, right? The more that we want it to be sturdy, the harder we're going to have to look at those high temp materials. And then durability. Well, how long is it going to last, right? How many load and unload cycles is it going to have? How many day-to-day -day wears is this device going to have? You have to understand, especially with Medicare and Medicaid, I think, and, and don't quote me on it, but I'm pretty sure when I looked at it last, usually they'll allow you to get an orthotic every five years. Now that's a little ridiculous with kids because kids grow, well, most of them. And so if you're saying every five years they can get a new orthotic, parents are putting a lot out of pocket. So these better be adjustable for their kids. What kind of density are we looking for, right? The more dense it is, the more rigid and durable the object's gonna be. Corrosion resistance. We don't have to worry about that so much here unless you've got somebody that's gonna you know, out in the outer regions of town, right? If I get somebody in like up towards uh, Mount Charleston, stuff like that, I've gotta start thinking about a little different material and I may be starting to think more stainless steel than I am aluminum or even just iron bracket fittings. If I'm from where I'm from, I've gotta be careful with rust. We have to know their daily environment and how much they know how to take care of stuff. Um, how easy is it to fabricate? Is it something that can be made in the clinic? Is it something that's gonna have to be sent off or is it gonna have to be something that's gonna be sent off to a major laboratory to make? So all that comes into play. And so with orthotic designs, we're gonna look at the three point pressure system, right? Mainly that there's going to be an upper pressure point, a mid pressure point, and a low pressure point. We have to know where all of those are because we have to be keeping an eye on them. Are they providing kinesthetic reminder? And then how much pressure is inside that orthotic? All of that comes into play when we're designing it. So the key thing here is the sum of all forces must equal zero. That would put that brace in, what was that term called again? From physics? One of the words is at the top of the page. Yeah, equilibrium, right? The equilibrium theory says that the sum of all forces acting on an object equals zero, right? And that could be static or dynamic depending upon what our brace is. In a three-point pressure system, single force applied between two additional counter forces with the sum of all equaling zero. Primary force is located at the place where movement is either inhibited or facilitated. So all of that's gonna come into play depending upon what we're looking at. Lever arm system, we've talked about this in physics. The farther the point of force from the joint, the greater the movement arm, the smaller the magnitude of force required to produce given torque at the joint. This is why most orthoses are designed with long plastic shells that are the length of the adjacent segment. The greater the length of the supporting segment, the greater the movement of torque can be placed on the joint. If we know somebody's got a very, very unstable ankle, we may not just want a short little stubby AFO. We may want an AFO that goes the whole way up their calf to provide a little bit more of a lever arm to provide some support for that ankle. That's kind of what this is saying. Other considerations. The force is at the interface between the skin and material, right? If we have plastics, our plastic's gonna create a rub on the skin. Yeah, they are, right? Plastics are not designed to be worn against us. It's not like we walk around in plastic suits all day. So we're gonna have to consider putting materials between ourselves and the, the actual orthotic. Um, how many degrees of freedom at each joint? If it has more than one degree of freedom, we have to consult, do we need to allow for protection from the other degrees of freedom? How many joint segments are we covering? Are we just covering the ankle? Are we covering the ankle and the midfoot? Are we covering the ankle and the knee? Uh, what kind of neuromuscular control does a patient have, including strength and muscle tone? If they're down in strength or down in muscle tone, we may have to make it a little bit more rigid. What type of materials are we selecting? The activity level of the client, right? If we know the patient's pretty sedentary and we have a, a clear idea that they're probably not going to change that, it'll affect our choice for orthotics, right? We may go with the heavier orthotic at that point because there's no need to go with a lightweight, more expensive orthotic if they're not going to be up and wearing them. Um, the goal of the orthotic is to meet the functional requirements of the client. So the idea here is 
you know, I'm going to use the broken, you know, broken radius or bro broken ulna as an example. If we're going to cast the arm for a broken ulna, we don't want to cast it all the way to the shoulder. We want to cast the area that's fractured. So if we cast it all the way to the shoulder, we lose all motion, and that's going to put a maximum restriction on the patient. So we have to minimize that restriction while we're working with the patient. We also want to make sure that we're in alignment with the body and we allow the movements that we want and control the movements we don't want. So that's where we're going to look at what are we looking for. And we're going to talk about an RGO and AFO in a little bit. Uh, what type of weight bearing are they going to have? Do we want to reduce axial loading or do we want to allow for axial loading? Uh, protection. How much protection do we need over that area? Um, in the case of like an ankle support or something like that, do we need to provide maximum protection the whole way around the ankle so that ankle doesn't buckle? Um, do we have neurological disorder like wrist strap where we need a cock up splint where it allows them to do things like wrist extension that they're missing? So we're gonna talk about a couple different orthotics, upper limbs, spinals, and lower limbs. So these are usually the names, they're named by the joints they encompass. So we have FOs or foot orthotics, right? Those would be like your shoe inserts and stuff like that. AFOs, ankle foot orthotics. KAFOs, knee ankle foot orthotics. HKAFOs, hip knee ankle foot orthotics. KO is just a knockout, uh, knee orthotic. Who's are wrist hand orthosis. EHU's add the elbow. EOs are elbow orthosis. And then SEOs are shoulder orthosis with elbows, right? Um, it's pretty rare that you're going to see an SE who, but it does happen where you have a shoulder, elbow, wrist, and hand, especially in the case of maybe a stroke, you might see it. So shoes, right? The foundation of any lower extremity orthotic starts at the foot. Serves two purposes, to reduce pressure by redistributing weight and serve as the foundation for AFOs or other sense of bracing. What type of things might we put in a shoe that would be considered a foot orthotic, do you think? Lift, okay, good, right? Lifts if they have what condition? Yeah, shorter leg, right? We have a, a leg length discrepancy between the sides, right? Whether that's a functional or structural leg length discrepancy. What else might we put in a shoe? An old lady who lived in a shoe? Arch supports, good, right? Heel cups, right, to provide some extra support back to the heel. Or what happens if I have something like a Symes amputation in the front of my foot? Does your foot feel a little different if you're missing the whole front of your foot? Just a bit, right? We may actually add almost a toe orthotic in the front that makes it act like there's actually toes up there still. So there's all kinds of things we can add to it. Diabetic shoes are technically considered orthotics, right? What is the difference between a diabetic shoe and a regular shoe? Other than they're ugly. Has anyone ever seen diabetic shoes before? Yeah, they're usually a little bit wider, good. They usually have a little bit more cushion and they're usually heavier. And all of that is to prevent that foot from getting breakdown, right? We want a little bit wider, especially at that forefoot region where you've got the widest part of your foot. Want a little bit wider back at the ankle to provide a little bit more space so that you don't get as much breakdown on those malleoli. There's also gonna be additional cushioning in the foot, right? And the additional cushioning is so that they don't get any additional breakdown on the bottom of their feet, but they're also heavier because the heavier the shoe, the more proprioceptive input that patient's gonna get when planning down. So insoles versus orthotics, right? When you hear Dr. Scholes, those are just insoles or inserts, right? They're just designed to add a little bit of cushioning. When you get into orthotics, you're starting to provide some sort of support to a part of the foot. Now, Dr. Scholes has been stepping into the area of orthotics a bit right? Especially with that uh, custom foot center or whatever that's in every Walmart and Walgreens. That thing grosses me out because think of all the people that stepped up on there on bare feet. 
and then people just get up on it like it's nothing. That that machine grosses me out more than anything. You know that the staff in Walmart or Walgreens don't clean those things because they're about as grossed out as everyone else. Right? But it tells you your custom orthotic number. That's great that we have those, but it's still better to go to an orthotist and get actually measured. Um, it was kind of funny when I went out to, there was a uh, PT night out at Relax the Back in Summerlin about four years ago. And they had drawings and I won one of the drawings to get custom orthotics. So I played along and the person giving me my custom orthotics was a 16 year old cashier. Um, not that I doubted their ability, but I just didn't really trust getting an orthotic from somebody that basically had worked there for three days, right? We, that's why orthotists go to school. They learn how to properly fit patients for the different orthotics. And then the orthotics, I showed you those shoe orthotics when I was in class a few, uh, probably last season, right? Or last, se yeah, last semester. Uh, foot orthosis consists of inserts inside a shoe. It's done to accommodate leg length discrepancies, reduce painful pressure. Um, there's various inserts on orthotics, right? UBL insert, University of California, biomechanics laboratory insert, holds the foot in a neutral position. Metatarsal pads. What if you know that a patient is more of a pronator? What might we want to do? What type of an insert might we put in the shoe? So the patient's a heavy pronator, right? We're gonna put support on the inside of the shoe to push them a little bit more in a neutral foot. Kind of medial raise, exactly, right? Patient's a supinator, we might put a lateral raise on the shoe. So all of that comes into play. And then specifically arch support's a major thing. We look at a lot of times, we miss out on this when the patients or we see patients that are either supinators or pronators, we don't look enough at the arch itself. And we look at, okay, we need to provide a support in the lateral aspect of the foot or a medial aspect of the sport, but really the problem is the arch, okay? And the good news is there's a lot in PT right now looking at how to improve that arch by strengthening those intrinsic muscles of the foot. And what are the intrinsic muscles of the foot again? What are the two groups called that are intrinsics of the foot? The same intrinsics of the hands. Lumbricals, good. And the neurosei, good, right? The lumbricals and the neurosei. Those are our primary, you know, foot and hand intrinsics. And then they're usually named between being, you know, plantar or dorsal neurosei, plantar or dorsal lumbricals. But we can, we can strengthen those by doing exercises like, you know, toe grabs and toe curls and all kinds of stuff like that to help increase the function of your arch. I may need a heel wedge, a metatarsal bar, so posterior to the metatarsal head, the bar transfers stress from the metatarsal phalangeal joints, the first metatarsal shafts. There's a rocker bar that's a convex strip attached to the sole, proximal to the metatarsal heads. It improves late stance as well as shifting load. There's all kinds of things we can add to the foot. Um, there's diabetic shoes, right? There's offloading shoes, post-op shoes, shoes with AFOs, all of that comes into play. Um, even if you look, that one shoe almost looks like one of those Skecher shoes there, but it allows for a lot better push-off as you're coming through. Uh, again, Zappos is really great with this. Zappos provides a ton of custom shoes for patients that need specific orthotic foot. Uh, and they're working with a lot of the companies, you know, we used to not get, be able to get name brands, uh, but now there are all kinds of them out there. Specifically, I'll give a shout out to New Balance. New Balance has always been kind of on the forefront of helping patients that need some form of a custom shoe. And, you know, when I grew up, New Balance was the fat kid shoe. Um, it honestly was, or the kid that wasn't cool. He had the New Balance shoes, you know. But nowadays, you know, New Balance is a lot on the cutting edge of different types of shoe design. There's a couple other different brands that are out there for making shoe designs. The main thing is though, when you have those patients that have those super wide feet like me, it's really hard to find a foot, a shoe that actually fits them. Technically, my shoes are orthotics. 
because they're not a standard D width shoe. Right, D is kind of the standard width. Then you have E, which is wide, and then you have me, who's 4E, which basically means I have duck flippers. So technically, mine are really considered orthotics. They really are, because they're really hard to find shoes that fit feet that are as big as mine. Not length, but you know, foot-wise. So here's a couple of different types of orthotics here, right? We have our kind of standard old school leather ankle brace. Right, hold on here, it's drawing. So this is kind of our old school leather ankle brace. We have a couple of different kitty orthotics over here for the legs. And then here's one of the old standard style ankle foot orthoses that attaches to the bottom of the shoe. Right, all those look different, all of those serve different functions as we're going through it. So an AFO is comprised of the foundation, the ankle control, and the foot control. And then there's going to be a superstructure, which is proximal portion. It allows sort of support around the calf mainly. The ankle control is usually prescribed to limit plantar flexion or, or dorsiflexion or both, or by assisting with motion. There's a lot of AFOs that will actually provide assistance in the dorsiflexion, that when the foot picks up, it snaps in the dorsiflexion. So there's dorsiflexion assist, which is what I was talking about. There can be a posterior leaf spring that's designed to assist with that dorsiflexion. The idea is that the plastic AFO upright is bent backwards and slightly during stance phase, and then it recoils to lift the foot. There's also steel dorsiflex assist, which are the Clenzac joints. These have stirrups comprised of coil springs, which are compressed in stance and rebounds during swing. Either one of these, when the foot plants down, will automatically pull that foot into dorsiflexion to help with, yeah, four scumps, exactly, to help with going into that dorsiflexion style. There's a metal, there's metal posterior stops, right? These usually are in hinged or solid AFOs. They limit plantar flexion. There can be an anterior stop that limits dorsiflexion if the patient is weak in plantar flexion. There's bi-channels that locks both anterior and posterior springs. And then there's hinged solid ankle foot orthosis that allows slight sagittal motion, but not as much, you know, dorsiflexion, plantar flexion. So here's a couple of different AFOs, right? And I don't remember which one of you was asking about a hinged AFO at the ankle, but there's what a hinged AFO kind of looks like. So what will happen is, as that person kind of goes this way, that hinge will bend and allow for dorsiflexion to happen. Right, and that allows for support. Whereas this one here would be considered what type of an AFO? Static, right? Yeah, that's not gonna allow any motion. And that's even not even allow a lot of lateral motion because those supports are pretty solid on either side, right? And then this one's using a lot bigger lever arm. You see that? Whereas up here, this is just where it attaches on. That's providing very little support to the ankle because it's very narrow. Um, and then of course we get kitty ones down here, a Tweety Bird on it. Here's kind of an old standard AFO that you just slip in. And again, here's one of those Force Gump shoes. And that one itself has a little hinge there to allow for movement. Then we get into the KAFOs. And again, for every joint that we add, we're taking a little bit of motion away from a patient, right? Knee joints often a simple hinge, which provides medial lateral stability and restricts hyperextension. A uh, common simple mechanism is usually a drop ring, which drops the place and the knee is fully extended and prevents the joint from flexing. There's sagittal stability is improved with these with a kneecap or anterior band strap, and this will allow three-point pressure. So if we have strap going across the front, the main goal there is also kneecap support. And then the frontal plan is achieved with plastic cuff-shaped shells shaped into reduced genovarum or genovacrum or genovalgum and genoverum. So here's some KAFOs, right? These patients really do not like, right? And this one would be a dynamic knee static ankle. So this is a combo, right? Whereas this one over here is what? Dynamic and dynamic, right? Because we've got dynamic knee and we've got a dynamic ankle. So both of those are going to be moving. This one over here, so number two and number one, 
number two is gonna provide the most freedom of movement for the patient. Whereas number one is gonna allow fairly normalized gait, but limit that ankle motion. So they're not gonna function as well and not gonna have as much as proper gait. So here's a couple of them, right? Clearly you can see that, how they kind of change based upon what the needs are of the patient, right? Another kind of similar ankle photorthosis here, right? And then here's poor little kid and their ankle braces. I guarantee you, no kid looks that happy on lost strength crutches and AFOs, just saying. I don't know what they bribed that kid with, but that must've been good. Here's standard knee orthosis. Usually when we talk about these, we call them knee braces, right? But they are orthotics. Most of the time with these, the limit, we're trying to limit one range of motion or the other or to lock them into one range. So technically, a knee immobilizer is a KO. It is a knee orthosis. Um, a lot of times, where's my little mouse at? There it is. A lot of times the braces that look like this that have that little dial in them that allows you to adjust the flexion and the extension. A lot of times those braces are often referred to as Bledsoe braces. Now, they're not all Bledsoe braces. Bledsoe was just a company that made a lot of them. And so they end up get they all get named it. It's the same thing with Philadelphia collars. Philadelphia used to be a brand name of neck collars. Now a lot of them are just called Philadelphia collars. But you may, typically if your PT is talking about putting a Bledsoe brace on a patient, it's a brace that's gonna have a dial on the side that's going to limit knee flexion, knee extension, right? You see a lot of, a lot, a lot, a lot of offensive linemen in football wear these. I don't know, if, for those of you that watch football, you see a lot of offensive linemen wear these. Why do you think they wear them? Yeah, so they don't hyperextend is number one. And then the other thing is, because they're so large, right, because they're so large, you know, I was just looking at the, there's one offensive lineman that, I can't remember what the guy's name was, but he runs a 5'10", 40, and he's 347 pounds. That's a missile coming at you. I'm doubting he has a lot of lateral stability in his legs. Yeah, he got drafted. He just got drafted. Yeah, a 5'10", 40 at that weight. Um, I calculated it out. It's like at impact, if he's hitting you at that 40, it would prevent. It would allow some frontal plane control, right? Exactly. Um, but at that impact point, if he's running a 540, you know, 540, you're talking about 1,500 pounds of force striking you at his impact point, or 15,000, or 1,500 newtons of force. That's enough to fracture an ulna, right? Exactly. I could not play football nowadays. It just terrifies me to see how fast these big guys are. They are steroids, exactly right. Whatever, we're gonna keep moving. Um, but yeah, I mean. The thing is, he's huge, he's fast, but he's not gonna have a, lateral, a lot of lateral stability in those knees, especially when he's down in three-point stance, so that a lot of those players will end up resorting to these. The downside to that is the more they wear these braces, what's happening to their lateral stability? It's getting weaker, yeah, right? So this is a kind of, this is, this is literally a time where the cure is worse than the disease. Right? So you hear that quite frequently with COVID right now. That's not true. But in this case, the cure is worse than the disease because the longer they wear that, the weaker their joint's going to get, meaning the longer they're going to have to wear it, which means the weaker the knee is going to get, which the longer they're going to have to wear it. And eventually, you know, they're going to be looking at knee replacements. I mean, it's as if, you know, walking around with, you know, 395 pounds probably isn't going to predispose you to knee replacements as it is. But they're already, they're just making their knees weaker as they go along. But the thought process on that is wearing the braces and having weaker knees is better than having no knees. 
Yeah, DBs can definitely break their knees really easy by going around them quickly. Yeah, usually their ankles are completely like taped into, it's almost a cast. And then you have the HKFOs, now we're adding the hip, and it usually has a pelvic band. Um, these are used less frequently due to the discomfort of the pelvic band, and they limit hip flexion extension, block during gait. Here's an HKFO. So a lot of times when you see this, that hip band up top there, so where, is it? It's up, where it's up here, a lot of times they'll call that a hip spica. And that even comes into play when we do um, ankle, or not ankle, residual limb wrapping. We'll create this hip spica when we're doing that knee wrapping for somebody who's got a total knee, or a, a total knee amputation where we create the support up at the hip to provide support for the knee. But a lot of times you'll hear that referred to as the hip spica. And then we have thoracic hip, knee, ankle, foot orthosis. Yeah, rarely seen except with except maybe reciprocal gait orthoses. The higher we go, again, the less movement the patient's gonna get and the more uncomfortable these braces are gonna be. A lot of times these are going to be used initially for just standing purposes, right? Here's basically a robot. But that technically, that technically is a thoracic, well, technically that would be a thoracic lumbar hip, knee, ankle, foot orthosis. We just usually discontinue this robot. We basically just don't count the lumbar because we figure if we're talking about thoracic, the lumbar is included anyway. Just think, how much work do you think it is to get that thing on? How long do you think it takes to put one of these on? Yeah, 30 minutes is on the good side. It's not uncommon to take, yeah. It's not very uncommon for these to take 45 minutes to put on a patient. And by the time you get that patient, patient in this, what do you think is usually the common problem? Yeah, they're already exhausted, right? So you get them in their little Iron Man suit and now they're exhausted. Exactly. Okay, that was good. I'm glad we got it on. It's time to take it off. And then we have these things called RGOs, which are reciprocal gait orthosis. These allow us to control from the backside getting one leg to move forward and the other leg to move forward. So if they pick up one foot, we can actually use that bar in the back to help move the other foot forward. Um, I use these quite a bit with kids, especially kids that are CP or something to that effect or really weak lower extremities because it allows them to, and I'm gonna use air quotes here, walk. They're not really walking, they're just getting upright mobility because a lot of my, the walk is actually gonna come from me moving the stuff in the back. So here's kind of what those RGOs look like. So when that one foot plants forward and once it rolls forward, it starts pulling the other one forward with it. And then you've got all these crazy controls back up here. So you've got these hinges here and those will allow for certain motions at the hip. One will do extension, one will do flexion. This latch here locks and unlocks the knee. So when the patient sits down, they can pull up on that and that knee will bend. And the ankles are usually fused. Usually, very rare that we have one of these that the ankle actually is functional at all. It's usually pretty solid. But yeah, again, once you get one of these on a patient, you're usually exhausted. And I'm certainly hoping that with this one over here, that the patient is just demonstrating wearing it because otherwise that gait belt's useless considering that no one is really standing by them. Um, but yeah, I mean, I guess you got a foot back there on that one picture, but. Uh, orthotic options for patients with paraplegia. There's mass produced ones, standing frames are common, swivel walkers, parapodiums, custom made orthosis, stabilizing boots, Craig Scott KFOs, which are the ones with the little hinge in the back. RGOs, and then you have the externally powered orthosis with pneumonics or, F, or pneumatics or FES. So all of these come into play when we have somebody that's got some sort of a paraplegia going on. So here's a standing frame, right? The patient sits down in this little sling here. We get them transferred over into the sling. I changed my color on board of red. So they get them sit in this sling and then we can use this pump to pull that way 
and it'll pull them into a standing position, right? Why might we try, if a patient can't stand up, why might we try to put them into a standing frame? Strengthening, okay. Relief pressure, definitely. What bones are we trying to weight bear through? Yes, get bearing, weight bearing through, so specifically getting weight bearing through that femur, right? Because the femur is really important for blood development and stem cell development and everything like that. So the more they can be standing on those legs, the greater the functions are gonna be of their general system. So we wanna make sure that we get them up into those. Um, tilt tables work nicely too, but this actually allows the patient to stand up kind of on their own limbs. Here's parapodium for kids. Uh, it's really common for these for kids in like the academic field to help them standing to stand up during the school day. A lot of times these kids will have to stand in these parapodiums for you know two hours a day. And it's nothing, it's not uncommon if you have one of these in the school schools that you'll come back, right? And the patient's now slumping down like this, their knees are bent, their hips are bent because somebody came by and allowed them, it's too, it's too much pressure, loosen up the straps. And now they're slumped in it, defeating the whole purpose of wearing it. So you've got to instruct, if there's an instructor in that class, you got to instruct them. Once you put them into that parapodium, they've got to stay in that parapodium. Then we talk about our trunk and our spines, right? There's lumbosacral corsets, there's rigid orthosis, custom LSOs and TLSOs. There's corsets and abdominal support, cervical collars, and scoliosis collar or scoliosis braces. All of those are going to provide a different level of support. Um, and yes, you see corsets down there. Corsets are technically considered an orthotic, right? And a lot of times when you see something like an abdominal binder, that's nothing more than a Velcro corset. Right? So all of those will provide some support. But again, anytime we start providing these, what's happening to the paraspinals wearing these? Weakening, right, good. So here's a cash brace, chest arm, chest, I forget what that stands for. It's chest something support harness. I forget what that's called at the top of my head, right? Is this gonna provide a lot of support to the patient? Chest abdominal, you might be right, there you go. What is this designed for? What do you think the main idea of this brace is? More orthotic, I've even got it. Yes, postural control, exactly right. This is not there to provide them with lumbar, lumbar support. It's to tell them stop leaning forward. What patients might these be good for? He answers me. I admit I probably need one when I'm video gaming now that I look at these. Seniors, right? Good. Kyphotic patients and desk workers, good. What condition in seniors might be really kyphotic? What's the one that's got that really hunched over? Yeah, Parkinson's, good, right? So this would kind of provide a little bit of support, but again, the more that we provide this kind of cueing, the weaker their overall muscle are. Even though this isn't providing a lot of support, it's still providing some. But this can be really useful, especially in the short term, to kind of get that patient upright. Um, if you, maybe even, you know, you get into where you're treating somebody that has, you know, uh, CP or a kid like that that's leaning way forward. This can be worn for a short period of time in order to get them that cueing they need to sit up straight. I think I'm starting to need, I need a cash brace. Here's different spinal orthosis, right? This one on the left here is more of your traditional kind of corset style or abdominal binder, whereas this one over here is a little bit harder and more of a solid brace. Goodbye. We'll be back. Here's your classic Jewett brace. And again, when you hear these names, most of the time it's by the company that designed them, right? Now this is taking that cash brace and adding a little bit more support to it. As you can tell, it's a little bit beefier of a brace. They're a little bit easier to customize. If you notice, they all have different plugs and buttons and everything we can add to them. 
Um, but this is definitely going to provide more of that support to that thoracic region than the cash. Oh, we have 28 people now. Do we get somebody new? Make sure we're not getting a... Oh, Alex is here twice. Cool. Um, cervical orthoses. A lot of times you're going to have the soft foam rubber collars. We have Philadelphia, Miami, J collars, Aspens, and then four post cervical orthosis we'll talk about. Halos. How many of you guys have seen somebody in a halo? Right? And I'm not talking like they're an angel. Right? Oh, look, you've got a halo over your head. No, it's weird, right? Halos provide maximal control. I, I will speak from experience on this. Halos suck. There is no other way to put it. Halos suck. Um, the wire halo brace must have a wrench readily available. It's often taped onto the vest, and I can't tell you how many times I lost that dang wrench. In case of emergencies to release the vest. It fell off that vest more than, they're like, we'll just put it on with hook and latch. And sure enough, I'd be laying in bed and it'd be on the floor. Not that I ever had to get out of the brace, but it just constantly fell off. Was it in the movie Mean Girls? Is that what that's from, Jeanette? Is that why you're saying that? Oh, okay. I've heard of the movie. I've never seen it. Um, during therapy and ADL use, overhead activity needs to be limited. You typically, they're going to have 90 degrees of shoulder flexion. To me, this was probably by far the biggest complaint. I mean, the pins were bad, but this was probably the biggest complaint I had with these braces on top of not being able to shower, is that I only had about 80 degrees of shoulder flexion. So that really limited what I could actually do. And it was really a pain in the butt. Um, even at that point, there wasn't a lot of video games because this was back in the early 90s. Um, that, was, that was when you're starting to get black and white AOL. But even typing at a computer was really uncomfortable in this. They're going to have 4 to 12 pins, which are screwed into the cranium about an eighth of an inch deep with eight pounds of torque. Yes, that is correct. These screws are going to be put into your skull and they cannot give you anesthetic. Yeah, playing Contra on Nintendo. Yeah, exactly. A, B, A, B, select, select, start. Um, when they put these in, it's really amusing because they'll drill one in, you'll pass out, they'll give you smelling salts. They'll drill another one in, you pass out, they'll give you smelling salts. It's kind of cruel. Um, it, but... They're needed. So remember when I told you when you had those um, external fixators? So these would technically be external fixators. When you talk about the ankle external fixators or the wrist external fixators, that you can grab a hold of the bars and it really doesn't hurt the patient. These you do not use as handles. Do not help the patient sit up by grabbing a hold of their halo. Are they trying to stray away? I mean, we're using them less. Typically, Mike, um, the only time you'll see a halo is a patient that has an upper cervical fracture, typically C2, C3, or C1. And the main reason is, is they want that completely. So like my, when I wore this, I had a C2 fracture of the dens. So what they wanted to make sure is that I didn't move my head any way, shape, or form because any movement I make could shift that fracture into the spinal column. So a regular spinal brace is not going to affect it. Yep. It's really common for a boxer to get those type of, so the, the break is called a hangman's fracture. It's where that dens kind of snaps off right in that spot where the dens attaches, right where that axis and atlas rotates. Um, so a lot of times we'll have to do this. The, again, the main thing I'll say is with the other braces, if you need to get a hold of the external fixator to help them move, it's not going to hurt the patient. Do not grab a hold of these halo handles. And I've seen doctors do it before. Yeah, I don't know if I'd do that, but um, I've seen doctors help a patient sit up at the edge of the bed by grabbing hold of the halo brace or the halo bars. Just don't do it.
Well, so Jenna, it depends. So if the C2 and C3 is of something like the um, pedicles, then they can go with the standard collar, right? Or maybe a little bit of a lamina, that would be okay with the standard collar. But if it's up in the dens region or C1 specifically, that's when we really gotta be careful because those bones can shift up into the frame and magnum. And that would probably be a bad day for a patient. So it depends upon what's fractured. And that's the thing about the spinal cord is, or spinal column is when you have fractures, you have to know what's broke, right? So when I broke my lower, so when I broke C2, it was from a drunk driver. When I broke my lower neck, C4, 5, or C3, 4, 5, there we go. What I fractured was all my pedicles. That's kind of scary. That had to be pedicle fracture. There's, I can't think of it a reason why they'd have them in just a Philly collar. That had to be a pretty weak fracture. I mean, let me rephrase that. Any neck fracture is not a weak fracture, but it had to have been something like pedicles or maybe the lamina. That's terrifying to me. I don't think I'd want somebody in that. I'd probably have them at least in an Aspen or a Phil in Miami. No way I'd have them in a, but then again, that's probably why I'm not an orthodist. So here's kind of the soft foam collar. These are usually the precursors to them going to the hospital. These are easy for EMTs to carry with them. These are just the limit motion. Right, and this is why if you're in a car accident and it's a pretty severe car accident, this is one of the first thing that goes on you, because they're always worried about spinal cord injuries. Here's your traditional Philadelphia collar; it's a little firmer. Um, and again, the main re what is the reason for that hole up front? So, what's the reason for this here? Obviously, to let air in, right? Yeah, so if we have to get access to the airway, we can. Exactly. Smoke breaks. Well, it depends. I mean, if you've got a trach, you might, I've seen people smoke out of their trachs. Um, here's your typical Miami J collar. And I don't ask me why it's called a Miami J. I've never, and the, the only thing I figure out is this kind of looks like a J right in the front part of it. But she looks really happy to be wearing that brace. I'm assuming it's a PT student. Here's your Aspen. The main thing you're gonna see and the main difference between most of the braces in an Aspen collar is this little thing up front here. And this one only has a small one. It's only got a, a moderate adjustment. What do those allow for? Does anyone know? Raise and lower the support, good, yep. So that will change this angle right here. So it can actually allow the chin to go down or be lifted up depending upon what you want, right? So they can loosen that a little bit and that'll allow just a little bit of neck movement, right? Especially if they wanna allow capital movement versus cervical movement. What's the difference between capital versus cervical movement? Yeah, head versus neck, good. Which is the head, capital or cervical? Capital, good. Be aware, because sometimes they'll ask you that question on the board. They'll be talking about, you know, a patient having limits in capital movement. And what they're talking about is literally head on neck movement, not neck movement. So capital versus cervical is important to understand. Here's a rigid cervical orthosis, right? Again, this guy looks way happier than he should be in this. Now, what do you think, why would we put this so, why did we add this extra, extra section down here? What are we doing? What's the point of adding that part down there? Posture maybe, okay, good, it's possible. We're restricting extension, good. What is this increasing? Stability by increasing the length of the Lever, good, there we go, good, good, good. That's what I wanted to get across, right? That increased the length of the lever arm. So that allows for more stability. Here's your traditional halo. I am guessing this guy in the upper left corner does not actually have this screwed into his head. 
I think he's just demonstrating it. But as you can see, the pins have to go into the inner bone layer. Those aren't comfortable, right? Now, most of the times, this guy has a smaller halo. Most of the times, it's going to be like this vest here. And that vest is metal with sheepskin under it. So what do you think you smell like after wearing it for about five weeks? Exactly, right? And you cannot, you'd be a dead, a dead sheep, exactly. You cannot take this off to clean under it. So you have to get under it as best you can. Um, wipes, yeah, they don't come off. Once that's on you, that's on you. So you're gonna have to get used to cleaning underneath it with wipes. You as a patient have to understand how to lubricate the whole unit and make sure everything's okay. If you feel anything out of whack, if you suddenly feel a little bit more pressure on one of the pins than the other, you have to know that and get your orthotist as soon as possible because that can cause problems. You can get a fracture of the skull from these. Um, but yeah, you, the, the chest brace and that do not come off. Those are on for good. So you've got to be able to clean under these. It also can be a challenge getting clothes on. Um, this is how I know this is this patient up here in the corner is actually not a legitimate patient because he has shirt under the brace. Most of the times when you're walking around with one of these braces, you're wearing, you know, Hawaiian shirts or in my area, you're wearing flannels because anything you can button up over the outside of it. Um, I will say back then, my girlfriend really loved me wearing that for long periods of time. Oh, sleeping was super uncomfortable. Sleeping was sitting upright in a chair always. Um, luckily, it was this, this was back when, you know, I had family and I was staying with family and I was able to sleep in the good old Lazy Boy recliner. But man, it sucked. Um, and it really limits your life because, you know, if you've got a smelly, stinky sheepskin on you, you're not going to want to go out and hang out with friends, even though your friends are like, oh, come out. We won't care. Yeah, they care. Here's a couple of different pictures of the halos in place. There's a kid with Atlanta axial subluxation. So we've got a little brace on. What disorder could cause Atlanta axial subluxation? Yes, good, good job, Ashley. I'm proud. Down, try so many 21 downs, exactly. I'll take either. Um, then we have our scoliotic orthosis, right? Milwaukee's in Boston. Again, name for the area they were developed in. So here's a Milwaukee brace. So when you're looking at this, and this is typically the post-op brace, when you're looking at it, you've got this part here. What is that part going to be right at? So that's putting pressure that way. What should that be at on the scoliotic injury? The apex, right? The primary curve, right? Now we may, and there have been some that I've seen that have this here and then up here, they've got another one pushing that way because maybe the patient's got a secondary curve to go with it. So they can adjust these and add as many as the patient needs for the scoliotic curve, right? Um, this poor kid's got, you can even see how uncomfortable her scoliotic curve is just looking at her standing here, right? That's not a very good curve. Um, but if, again, it's one of those, if we can correct it early, it helps their development later in life. Here's other braces, right? Look at the curvature here of this lady on the right, right? Look at that, look how hooked, and then we've got two curves, right? And we'd have to figure out what is primary with secondary, and then we can correct it. And look how much more upright she is. But look at her neck once. You see how her neck, even with correction, isn't straight up and down? Because she still developed an adjustment because of it. Yes. So concave is the cave. You're going into the cave. Convex is the direction. This, yes. Yep. So if you have a convex curve to the left, that means your peak or your apex is going to be out towards the left. Um, I'm looking at this, this girl on the, 
the right here probably has one, two, three curves. And what they chose to do is correct two of those curves, figuring the third curve will self-correct. Um, but I don't know, I don't think either of them look very comfortable in their braces. I don't know about you guys. I love how they blurred out one part of her. That's just fantastic. This is a Boston. So remember, when we have a scoliotic curve, what are the two types of scoliotic curves we can have? You remember what the two different types are? Maybe. I know Dr. Reskin talked about it and I've talked about it. Okay, it's one of those days. CNA, okay, well, that's not really what I was looking for. At C and S, yeah, C is the traditional, but you either have a structural or a functional curve. You remember that? That was your next guess. I like it. Good job, Gene. Right? So structural or functional. So those past braces were primarily to fix structural curves post-surgery. The Boston brace is often used for a functional curvature. Right? What, is, what does a functional curvature mean? You remember? What's it usually caused by? Yeah, when you bend it, it disappears, right? So what's usually a functional curve caused by? Poor what? Poor posture, right, exactly. So you have that functional, it's usually caused by poor, po poor posture or it could also be caused by maybe a lower hip problem or something to that effect as well. But functional, usually we can correct with the simple bracing and teaching them to have proper posture, right? Now, this is not a hard rule when you're looking at these, but if you're looking at the braces, the number of holes typically indicate the number of curves you're trying to correct. So this is pushing a little bit that way. This is pushing a little bit that way. So you're trying that one's probably trying to correct two different curves. But again, these braces are a lot easier to wear than those other ones. Right, this just has Velcro on the front, you put it on. Um, what do you think some of the problems might develop from this other than pressure? What about breathing? Yeah, exactly. Not gonna have full rib expansion here or definitely not be able to diaphragmatic breathe. So you're gonna have to talk to them after getting off this brace, teaching them how to diaphragmatic breathe after taking the brace off. Most of the times with these braces, anytime, it's going to say anytime OOB. What does OOB mean again? Out of bed. Good. Uh, out of breath too. Yeah, if you're talking breathing. But if you see orthotic to be worn while OOB, that means that anytime they are out of bed, they have to have it on. From PT standpoint, that means if we are going to sit them up, you usually over close, yep. But it, the key thing here is any if you see something that says OOB, usually that means if you sit them up, sitting them up at the edge of bed is considered out of bed activities. So that means you need to try to put the brace on while they are still lying down if possible. Um, it would, it, well, the nice thing is it's usually conformed to their body. That's why they do heat molded plastics, Alex. So it usually doesn't slide too much. Um, we're going to kind of ask them to wear standard t-shirt like material because t-shirt material provides a little bit of uh, friction over the area so it doesn't slide as much. But if you wear something like rayon or even those air wicking shirts, then it can slide a little bit um, or silk, anything like that. The normal t-shirt will give enough grip for it. And a lot of times if you can see, uh, you can see in the one here, right? If you look on the inside of this one, you can see that little bit of uh, it's probably some sort of a hard, a soft plastic on the inside of it to help keep the grip. Kind of like dice them or something to that effect in there. Here's a Knight Taylor brace. Again, more to keep upright. The Milwaukee brace post-op, poor kid. Upper extremity orthosis, right? We can have who's, wrist hand orthosis. We can have finger orthosis. We can have elbow orthosis. We can have shoulder orthosis. 
All of these come into play, but it's just like the knees and the tank legs, right? It just depends upon what we need. The finger orthoses are kind of the, you'll see a lot of these lately, um, especially if somebody's been in hand therapy. These are just ring splints. They're usually used to help prevent flexion or extension deformity, right? Um, a lot of hand therapists wear these when they're treating because they're doing such fine motor movements, their own hands start developing contractures or deformities or boutonniere deformities or stuff like that. So a lot of hand therapists wear braces or silver splints while they're working. Um, this is just your traditional wrist brace, right? Most wrist brace are going to cock slightly into the, the uh, wrist extension. And that's just mainly so that you can pick things up. It allows for that a little bit of functional. Um... Oh my gosh, why am I drawing a uh, functional grip function there? Uh, here's another elbow one. And again, when you see those dials, that means you can limit them in either flexion or extension. And here's a shoulder brace. Uh, I've always not been a fan of these because I just don't, and whenever I've had these, I've never had good luck with them. Um, patients, A, don't wear them. The other thing is they always put this part here on too tight and then they end up compressing that axial nerve and they'll be walking around going, I don't want my hands going to sleep. And you'll get, you look down at their hand, their hand is blue. So just be aware of that. And even the hand braces, you've got to be careful. You've got to make sure that you can see the limb so that you can see what color the fingers are. Do they have functional blood flow? Can we do a capillary refill test on them? Everything like that. Oops, that's still draw. Uh, PT will perform pre-orthotic assessment. If the orthotic is recommended, then a consult will be placed to an orthotist. PT should be present, present at all times to prevent and help with the orthotic prescription. We need to understand what the patient needs to be wearing. So if the PT is not there, we need to be there when the, ortho the orthotists come in. It's really common um, for that orthotist to sneak in and sneak out without you ever seeing them. You got to make sure you're working with your orthotist and tell them, when you go into that room, I need to be in with you because you need to see what's going on. Once the prescribed orthotic wears, it'll need to be evaluated with the patient. Usually the orthotist is going to see the patient twice, once to fit them, and then once to make sure the fit actually matches up, almost like you're talking with those wheelchairs. A wearing schedule may need to be outlined. Most of the time, patients are not going to immediately go to wearing this 24 by 7. So you're going to have to start them on low wear to work them up to wearing it as long as possible, especially with orthotics of the feet. Uh, PTA may work with the patient upon receiving the orthotic. Patient's therapy program, plan of care may need to be revised once the orthotic is available. The patient may not be allowed out of bed until the orthotic is there, right? So we can see them for bed activities, but now the orthotic's there, and now they're going to have to be seen by the PT for out of bed activities. So be aware of that. Their static and dynamic assessment checks to see if they are anything in static or in movement. Um, we really have to try to facilitate this orthotic acceptance. We need to get them to where they accept the fact that they need this orthotic. And it may take time. Um, the biggest complaint I hear is they're ugly or they're uncomfortable. Well, they're not supposed to be comfortable. They're designed to facilitate functional movement. And if they don't wear them, they can end up back in the hospital. I often tell them that. If you don't wear this, you end up back in surgery again. Oh, want surgery again. Well, good, then wear it. Um, Donnie, patient needs to use clean socks with all ankle foot orthosis. Please, for the love of everything, don't let them wear their AFOs without socks. I don't think so. Did we? Did I skip slides, guys? Okay. I was losing my mind there for a second. I mean, it's, it's possible. Um, you might have been when you were transferring in and out. Well, it's just the pictures. Yeah, it was just, we're going through some of the pictures. That's all. There's not really much of a need for you guys. If you want to look at the pictures, you can look at the pictures on your own. Um, but yeah, so if they're going to wear, a, if they're going to wear socks or if they're going to wear the AFOs, they've got to have clean socks on, right? Don't let them wear like crusty two-day-old socks. 
It's just gross. I, I can't tell you how many times. And also, if they're going to be wearing an AFL, make sure they actually have real socks, not those little footy socks that I see some of you wear sometimes, like that I'm wondering if you're even wearing socks. Um, those aren't good for AFOs. They've got to have functional socks. They may even have to get the old school knee highs. So be thinking about that. Practice instruction with the patient. When donning lumbar sacral and lumbar thoracolumbar lumbar sacral corsets, it should be done in supine. But some patients will learn to do it in sitting. Ideally, supine's best, but if they can't get it on in supine, sitting's the next best. And then sit to stand activities may need to be done in parallel bars initially for KAFOs and TKAFOs. Gait training. Can patients take steps with either or both lower extremities? Can they weight bear? Um, how much upper extremity power do they have, right? Are they able to push up off the floor by pressing down on the hands? Are they able to stand up using their hands? And then you need to have kind of a final follow-up, final assessment of follow-up care. It's usually the last review of precautions, fit, applications. Um, when you're working with patients, doesn't matter if it's your first visit or if it's your 32nd visit seeing them. You should always review any precaution they have. If they're a total hip, you review your total hip precautions. If they're a spine, review their spinal precautions. You review them every single time until they no longer have precautions. It's the only way patients are gonna learn. We learn through consistent and constant feedback. So be aware of that. Ask the patient, okay, what are your spinal precautions again? No bending, lifting, twisting. I know you talk about this every time. Great. You scored 100% this time. Make it a game. They need to know their precautions. Uh, make sure family members know what to do if there's a problem with the orthotic, right? Especially in the case of the halo. If there's a problem with the halo, they need to know who they can get in touch with. They need to have a cell phone for the orthotist and the PT. Because if they're wearing that halo and one of those pins starts, you know, impinging on the skull, it does not take that much force to cause a crack. So they've got to make sure that they're monitoring that stuff. Um, children with reciprocating, reciprocating gait orthosis and crutches use as much energy as possible in propelling in a wheelchair. Right? Paraplegic adults with thoracic spinal cord lesions, energy expenditure for donning and doffing the extremity is too high. Therefore, we may result to wheelchairs, right? So if wearing one of these braces is going to wear them out where they're non, you know, no, they have no mobility, then a wheelchair might be the best idea. If they're hemiplegic, gait with an orthotic is not as energy consuming as with spinal cord injury. It makes sense. If they have half the body up, you know, it's not going to be as time consuming. If they have spasticity, the level of energy that they're using is going to go up. Um, type of orthotic is not as important in energy that is in the patient that has the orthotic in the evaluation of energy standard. Again, we got to be constantly looking at ways we can conserve energy. The more we conserve energy, the more compliant the patient's going to be with wearing their brace. We'll hit prosthetics here. So a prosthetic is an artificial device to replace a missing part of the body. And yes, they have dog prosthetics, right? And they now have fancy running prosthetics, they have walking prosthetics, they have everything you can possibly think. They can replace just about everything. What about a glass eye? Is that a prosthetic? Yeah, it actually is. It's not replacing an eye functionally, right? Because it still doesn't help you see, but it's replacing an eye cosmetically. So what about somebody that's had a mastectomy and they've got one of those, uh, the, the, you know, the, the special brassieres that kind of provide them with the, set, the breasts that they're missing? That is still considered a prosthetic, right? So because it's replacing a missing body part. That poor dog doesn't look that happy wearing those, I'm just saying. So causes of amputations, we can have diabetes, right? Diabetes is probably the number one cause of amputations, especially the lower extremities. Burger's disease, this isn't something McDonald's provides, but Burger's disease is a slowly degenerative disease of the legs and that. Trauma, infection, tumor, and then congenital disorders all can cause amputations to occur. 
when we're talking about amputations, we've got to think about how we're going to bevel the bone. What kind of a shape do we want that bone in? Are we going to resect the nerve or are we going to completely sever the nerve? What's the posterior flap going to look like? How's it going to look on the back side? What's the contour of the flap looking like? What kind of soft tissue attachments do we need to worry about? Where is the patellar tendon going to go? Um, what kind of closure do they use? Do they use staples or did they use sutures? And then how much bone length do we actually have? Excuse me. So when we have soft tissue attachment, for example, when we have a, you know, a, a below knee amputation or an at knee amputation or above knee amputation, we're often gonna have leftover patellar tendon. Well, if we take that patellar tendon and attach it to the backside of the femur, that is a myodesis, that's a muscle to bone attachment. If we then attach the patellar tendon back to, say the hamstrings, that would be a myoplasty, that's attaching muscle to muscle. So it depends upon their functional goals and what they'll do and what we have left. So these are the breakdowns of the different types of foot amputations, right? You can have a toe disarticulation, transmetatarsal. If you look, a lot of times they're named for what's being cut off. So transmetatarsal is going to go through the metatarsals. You have a list frank amputation, which is usually that midfoot region. And a lot of times you'll hear somebody getting a list frank fracture, to fracture that midfoot. Chopar, right? Hind foot, such as the Boyd's. You have Symes, where you've had full ankle artic disarticulated. You have a standard below knee, short below knee, total knee disarticulation, long above knee, medium above knee, short above knee, very short above knee, hip disarticulation, and hemipelvectomy is a lot of the pelvis is being removed. You need to know exactly what each of those is going to be. The good news is, for your boards, you don't have to know what all of these mean. Thank you, Mr. McKeever. You're very welcome. You do need to know what a transmetatarsal foot amputation would be. It's going through the metatarsals. You do need to know what a below knee amputation is. If they have a below knee amputation, they still have a functional quote, quote, knee. If they have an above knee amputation, they ain't got no knee. Right? So just think of them the way they're labeled, right? Excuse me. A trans tib is always going to be a baloney amputation. A trans femoral is always going to be an above knee amputation. So when you're looking at those, if you get a question that's talking about an amputation and you don't, you're worried about it, find your keywords and then write on your whiteboard. So here's a partial foot filler for patients that have had partial foot removed. There's a partial fake foot, partial fake foot. All of this comes into play. Mmm. Symes amputation. Procedure is more of disarticulation of all the foot bones removed, and the malleoli is often beveled and shaved down. The heel pad is wrapped distally and therefore allowing weight bearing on the residual limb. I should have warned you guys before I flipped this picture, but it's much more fun to see Justin's face. So in this case, they're literally going to take off the foot. And they're going to bevel down those malleoli so we have a nice smooth surface down here that we can attach a prosthetic foot to. Type of prosthetics. Prosthetic is endoskeleton. It uses aluminum, titanium, graphite, and other tubular materials to form a central supporting structure. If it is an endoskeletal uh, prosthetic, that means it is what? Inside the skeleton or outside? inside, so it's going to attach to a bone, versus an exoskeletal prosthetic is now outside, right? So a lot of times with those endoskeletal prosthetics, they're going to be putting a pin somewhere in the leg in order to connect maybe to an exoskeletal. A lot of times they'll have interchangeable connectors and other components such as knees, ankles, and feet. Structure of strength is important. It's usually from the skeletal components shape or cosmesis of the ex external removable, often usually a soft foam material covered with nylon or flexible hosing. Exoskeletals are kind of our most common that we see. 
with older design without our plastic laminated skin or shells, kind of made to look more like a, uh, a body part. For example, that a peg leg from a pirate would be an exoskeletal prosthetic. Strength is provided by the outer lamination and the shape of their cosmesis is important. So here's an endoskeletal. So there's going to be a pin that goes down. Where's my little draw thing? There's my little draw thing. There's going to be a pin that comes down off the femur that's going to allow for that knee, or that foot orthotic to go in place, or that prosthetic. Exoskeletal is the whole thing. So the socket's going to go around the leg and provide the support, right? Which one of those do you think is more comfortable, the endoskeletal or the exoskeletal? What do you guys think? Would you rather have a pin sticking out of your bone, or would you rather just have the socket? So it truly depends upon the patient. Um, I find a lot of patients structurally like the endoskeletals where they have a pin kind of coming out that they can kind of attach something to. The exoskeletals get hot really easy. Oh yeah, the socket can bleed and hurt, absolutely. Um, you know, their nerves aren't completely dead with it. So you have to be aware of that. You have to teach them how to treat it and take care of it as well. So it depends upon your, what your functional level is. If the patient's not going to be very mobile and not going to be moving much, maybe the exoskeletal is a better way to go, where they just slip that leg down into a socket and the socket provides the support, right? So on the, the right, the socket's providing the support, so the leg's going to go all the way down in, right? So let me get my annotate up here. So the leg is going to go all the way down in here. And these walls are going to provide the support. In this one, whatever the pin is, the pin's going to provide the support. And then we're going to rely on the natural bone function. Oh, went too far. So here's kind of what happens with that transtibial below knee amputation. I think that one picture, picture D, kind of looks creepy. It looks like a weird smiley face. Now you won't be able to unsee it. I come down, chop off. Right, so here we're gonna have this external flap. That flap's gonna be carterized and it's taken off, folded up, and they're gonna sew it up. So you're gonna have a little bit of your tibia and a little bit of your fibula left over. Um, now they can excise the fibula, it's not necessarily necessary for it. Um, but most commonly they leave a little bit of it in there because that provides a little bit of lateral stability. Um, but when you're looking at this, right, you're looking at that fold back there, they're taking a lot of tissue and folding it back that way. So that's still got a, a chunk of tissue in this area here. And the point of having that chunk of tissue there is so that it provides a little bit of cushioning for the patient. Because the more cushioning they have, the softer it's going to be and the more it's going to feel comfortable putting a prosthetic. So transfemoral, they're going to come in here and right above the femur, they're going to open it up, split up that rectus femoris and all those muscles, open it up almost like it's a, I guess, almost like a fish or a snake eating itself and then go right through that femur. And then they'll sew that back to the back side of the leg. Um, knee art disarticulations, amputation occurs through the knee joint. Uh, tenodesis occurs anchoring the quad tendon to the bone. So a lot of time what they're going to do in this case, when they're doing just right at the knee, they're going to take that quad tendon and bring it right back to the bone on the back side. And that'll allow them to actually still get some hip flexion going on. Total hip disarticulation, right? Entire lower limb is removed. Patient uses the, sock, the socks to sit in the socket. So the socket's going to be up here. And they're going to allow for the hip to actually kind of sit in that socket. And then again, you've got that hip spike or that upper hip strap that's going to provide prim primarily support. Um, there's a couple different types of prosthetics. You have manual locking prosthetics, which provide maximum stability. They can be locked and unlocked when ready to sit. Very similar to the knee orthoses. Um, then you can add the automatic unlocks that determine based upon a specific motion as well. There's fluid controlled, used for active individuals. Swing phase can be adjusted to keep up with the, the varying patient cadences. 
So a lot of times if you have a fluid controlled knee, the main idea is you're gonna be more of an ambulator or more of a runner as well. So preoperative, patient's getting ready to have an amputation. What are we gonna do? Well, we need to strengthen them. The strong, and this goes actually even for total knee replacements and pretty much anything. The stronger the patient is going into surgery, the better results post-surgery. So if you can get them working and strengthening pre-surgery, a lot of times they'll have a better post-surgical output. Um, there's just a study that showed that even pre-strengthening activity or seeing PT prior to having any surgery correlates to a lower post-surgical infection rate which, I mean, it kind of makes sense to me, right? If they're getting up and moving, getting more functional, there's less of a chance for that infection to set in because they're going to be less likely to be kind of just sitting around after the surgery. At immediately after a post-operation, they're going to get a rigid dressing. And depending upon what type of a replacement or what type of an amputation they had, that dressing can either be removable or non-removable. And the goal of the rigid dressing, right, is to protect that residual limb. Our goal in PT is going to be to prevent these contractures from occurring. So the main goal, whenever you look at a question on your boards that's talking about amputations, your main goal is going to be to prevent flexion contractures. Again, I'm going to say that again. When you have an amputation, your main goal is to prevent flexion contractures. If you can't prevent a flexion contracture, they're not going to be available for a prosthetic. They have to have full leg extension and knee extension in order to get a functional prosthetic. I you might have want to beat that in a little bit, huh? So that means when you're looking at a question from the boards, and the board is asking what type of movement do you want to prevent with an amputation, you're gonna be looking for flexion activities. If you're looking at it says, what kind of activity should you promote, you should be promoting extension type activities. The problem with most of these amputations, they're gonna come out and they're gonna want a pillow right under that residual limb like that patient has right there. That is starting to already start a flexion contraction. It's pretty amazing how fast those flexion contractions occur with amputation. So you've got to keep them in extension. Media post-op prosthetics, removable so dressings can be changed, allows total contact to allow ambulation post-surgery. They're also usually the heaviest and least functional, but at least allows them to stand and maybe walk a little bit after surgery. They're usually bulky and huge and the socks are not comfortable and the patients don't like them. Then they're going to go into a shrinker fitter. A shrinker fitter is once the staples have been removed from the surgery and the shrinker's job is, what do you think the shrinker's job is for the residual limb? You had to mold it, right? It's to shrink the limb. It's to mold it and get it ready for going into a prosthetic, right? So it's kind of force any fluids out of it and keep it in that nice shape that we want. Um, the patient has to have minimal to no drainage at that point. And it should be worn as much as possible. If it can be worn 24 hours a day, wear it 24 hours a day. But they should not shower with their shrinker on. A lot of the shrinkers themselves are made of cotton materials that a lot of times if they get hot water on them or something like that, they may shrink or stretch. How long does it typically take for what thing? to get to the shrinker phase or what are you asking? Bueller. I mean, if you're talking, oh, sorry. Oh, to be ready for an orthotic? I mean, that's gonna, so, and I tell my patients this, they can be ready as soon as those staples come out if they follow their wear schedules of their shrinkers and their, their the residual limb shapers prior to the shrinker, they can literally get an orthotic as soon as those staples come out. But a lot of times it doesn't happen that way. It may be four to six weeks after, they may be in a temporary ortho or temporary prosthetic, is the proper term, right? Temporary prosthetic for longer because temporary prosthetic is usually a longer prosthetic and again, heavier. 
and it's not gonna be their permanent one, but they may be in that longer because they're not shaping that residual limb. So how soon can they get into their full-time prosthetic is going to depend upon how diligent they are at following the precautions. If they get a flexion contracture, we can't put them in a full-time or full-time normal prosthetic. We've got to take care of the flexion contracture before you can put them in it. So this is what we've got to kind of make sure of for this patient is that they are adhering as much as possible. You've got to involve family on this as well. Family has to be involved. Um, watch for rolling of the shrinker. It should have no wrinkles, no rolls, no nothing like that. Anytime you have a roll or a wrinkle, it's an area of pressure and can create breakdown. So they've got to be watching for that as well. They should also be watching for any pressure injuries. In order to get a prosthetic, the patient must possess the desire to ambulate. If the patient doesn't want to walk, we cannot force them to walk. They may be a better candidate at that point for a wheelchair. They must be a candidate for a prosthetic device, meaning that limb has to be properly sealed, it has to be shaped, it has to be ready to receive that prosthetic. Decision area has to be healed and they have to have a prescription from a doc. Now that's changing a little bit. Some areas of PT can order this, but primarily it's still the doc that has to order the prescription for the prosthetic. Once straightened by the doc, the prosthetist can come and evaluate the patient and then discuss the goals with the PT and PTA. So we need to know what the patient's goals are. If they're just to sit in a chair, then maybe a wheelchair is a better option for them. We will work side by side with the prosthetists on gait training. And again, if you're gonna be an orthotist, most, pay, most of the people that go on for orthotist training also become prosthetists. So that you can kind of work in P and O, which is the common term for it. So when we have something like this, where we're working with patients that have prosthetics, we need to know what their goals are. If their goal is to get back to something like golf, they need more functional prosthetics. If their goal is just to be able to get out of their living room chair and walk back to the bathroom and back, they may not need as high tech prosthetics as maybe some of that's gonna be running. So we have to understand their goals. Lower extremity training, we have to teach them how the socket fits. They have to get a static evaluation of what's going on, how how high does that prosthetic need to go? What's the process of putting it on, taking it off? We have to teach them skin inspections, pre-prosthetic and post-prosthetic. We have to teach them a wearing schedule. A normal redness, so a normal little bit of pressure should disappear after 15 to 20 minutes of taking the prosthetic off. If it doesn't, then we've got an area of high pressure and that could seriously lead to a pressure injury down the line. So if the patient takes off their lower leg prosthetic and they're monitoring what their foot, their knee, lower knee looks like and suddenly they see an area of red that's not going back to normal, they need to let us know about this. Because if they don't, it can lead to bigger problems down the road. So here's pressure sensitive areas and pressure tolerant areas of the transtibial stump, right? So these are areas where all of when this prosthetic goes on, there's somewhere in one of these areas that they're going to have pressure, right? Now, normal pressure, so all the net force of these pressures should equal out to be what? Just like with an orthotic. The net force should all equal out to be zero, right? Good. So what I'm saying here is, let me get my little drawer up here. The pressure going inward or outward versus the pressure coming inward, if there's five newtons going this way, there should be five newtons of force going that way. And if there is, that net force equals zero, that part of the knee will be stable, right? But let's say, in this case, we have 20 newtons of force going that way but only four newtons of force going this way. What's gonna happen with that prosthetic? What do you think? It may break, right? The main idea here is this area over here 
is going to look, it's, yeah, they're going to have a little bit more movement, exactly, right? And the other thing is that area there in that medial as or that lateral aspect is going to have a ton of pressure breakdown. So they're going to, that's one where they're going to take that prosthetic off. We're going to look and that area is not going to get, stop being red after 15 to 20 minutes. They're going to have, will that give them more of a valgus knee or a varus knee? Very good, valgus knee. Good, right? Because remember valgus goes this way where the knees go together and get knock knee, whereas varus are very wide knees. So they're going to have a lot of valgus pressure on that knee. So anything we have in the front, we should have in the back. Anything we should have in the bottom, we should have on the top. Those all should be pressure tolerant areas. These are pressure you know, pressure sensitive, and these are pressure tolerant. These are areas where a lot of the, it's gonna provide support. So these are more, when I think these, these are the areas I'm the pressure sensitive, I'm looking for pressure injuries. These are areas that are gonna help take off some of that chance of pressure injury. These are the larger areas that are gonna absorb more of it. A lot of times these are the areas that have a little bit more meat on them because they're gonna provide some support and some takeaway. So what do you need to know for this? Well, if you're in the clinic and you're working with uh, prosthetics, you need to know all of this, right? For your boards, if they're talking about the knee having, you know, excess pressure on the lateral aspect of the knee, the prosthetic is putting excess pressure, let me get back over here, this way, right? The knee is going to form a valgus formation, right? And you're going to have pressure both here where it's pushing and a lot of pressure on that inside where it's getting squished against. So you have to be looking for pressure injuries in those areas. So body structure, we need to get proprioception going. Tapping and vibrations big to get them to feel like that leg is normal again, right? Balance, we're gonna have to work on multi-directional weight shifts. We have to make sure that they're going to be functional in all directions. What happens when they're walking on non-compliant versus compliant surfaces? Because not everything's gonna be nice and hard. Um, visual challenges, right? What happens when their vision's taken off walking? Multitasking, what happens when somebody's talking to them while they're walking? And then also carrying objects. These patients need to be able to get back to normal function of life. Uh, static and dynamic approach, the ability to stand quiet, right? Standing quiet means standing without a lot of sway back and forth or any muscle vibration or fibrillation. Work on varying terrain and speeds, manual perturbations, are they able to handle a little bit of pushing around? If a patient's got a right transfemoral amputation, so above knee amputation, do you think they wanna spend a lot of time in single leg stance? You think you're gonna want, yeah, you don't wanna necessarily work constantly in single, Balance is not that important on that leg, right? I mean, don't get me wrong, balance is important, but it's not like they're gonna be doing a bunch of pirouettes on an amputation leg. They need to have enough single leg stance balance to walk or to run or whatever their option is. And then they need to start trusting their prosthetic, right? The more they wear that prosthetic, the more they will trust it. And we need to work on false simulations. And when you're working on fall simulations, you have to work on fall simulations where they lose the prosthetic. That for whatever reason, the prosthetic falls off. What do you do now? Right? So first of all, obviously, they're going to have to find the prosthetic. Then they're going to have to figure out how to get the prosthetic back on. They're going to have to figure out why the prosthetic fell off in the first place. Was it a loose socket? What caused the problem? Then we're at the work of pain management. Like Ashley, I believe, said that a lot of times with those pins and that, they can have a good bit of pain initially. They'll get over it after a while, right? Because again, pain is just the body's way of calling attention to the area that's been injured. Eventually, they can kind of learn to shut that pain off, but they may then end up with phantom pain. And then we have to learn how to do that. Maybe some mirror box therapy might work. Um, maybe just telling them, look, it's, it, a lot of it is in your head and we have to get through it. Flexibility, again, the main goal is to be going into what direction flexibly? What direction we want to concentrate our flexibility on? Into extension, good. And then hip stabilization. 
How stable are they up at the hip? Because if you lose a knee, if you're a transfemoral amputation, you've lost ankle strategy and knee strategy. The only strategy you have left is hip strategy. Are they able to return to their prior level of function, right? What if you're a truck driver? Are you gonna be able to drive truck after having an amputation? What do you think? So you're a long haul road driver and you've lost your right leg. Can you still drive truck? I mean, yeah, probably not though, honestly, unless you've got some serious modifications, right? If you practice a lot, but think about it. I don't know how many of you guys have been in those big rigs, but those big rigs are usually manual transmissions. So now you lost a foot. Yeah, right, now we got some problems. You may have to go to automatics. You may have to go to a kitty whopper with automatic transmission, right? Leo, how's, how's wearing that up prosthetic going to have affect pressure while they're long haul driving, right? Maybe they don't wear their prosthetic when they're driving. And then if they are not wearing the prosthetic, what happens to the limb in the seat that they're in? Do we have to get a custom cut seat to allow for that limb to drop a little bit more into extension? So there's all kinds of things you have to think about with their prior level of function. What if you have somebody that's a football player? Are they gonna be able to necessarily go back to playing normal football? It doesn't matter if you're talking football or American football, they may not be able to go back to normal football after that. Likelihood is pretty low, honestly, right? You have an offensive tackle that gets a transfemoral amputation, are they gonna be able to go back to normal function? Probably not. Right, so that's the thing that you have to be kind of get to be really, really it depends on that modification exactly, right? You have to be really, really honest with your patients on that. Um, we have to correct improper habits. They're always going to get bad habits wearing these prosthetics. If they're not wearing enough socks, um, not protecting that limb, not checking for pressure injuries, we've got to break them up. And then, what are their activities based on their function? Right? Can they move around? Can they get out of bed? Right? What are the components of function? What are their goals? Right? What if you have an offensive tackle and their goal is to never go back to football and you're focusing on getting them back to football? Your goals don't match up with what the patient's goals are. They're not going to be compliant. You've got to match your goals to their goals. Otherwise, they will never be compliant with you. Stairs. How do they go up and down stairs? A lot of prosthetics, they're going to have to go up and down stairs backwards. And that can be a scary thing for patients. Um, how do they function on ramps and hills? Around here, it's not as bad. I mean, there are hills here, but in general, let's face it, the hills are not that bad in this area, unless you live up near Lone Mountain or out towards Red Rock or anything like that. It's, it's not like this place is, you know, the rolling hills of Pittsburgh, right? You can always tell somebody that's lived in Pennsylvania by the size of their calves, because pretty much everything is uphill. Um, you know, so ramps and hills are big. Sit to stand training. Are they cheating when they sit to stand or are they not cheating? So we have to work on that. Functional transfers, floor recovery. How do they get up? Normal gait. How do they turn 180 degrees? How do they turn 90 degrees? What is braiding? Not with the hair. Does anyone know what braiding is? With gait? What do you think? Anyone have any guesses? Never heard of it. Okay. Yeah, swerving while walking, right? Yeah, it's in and out movements, crossover movement. Exactly, right? That's that, technically it's that put your right foot in front of the other while, you know, heel to toe type walking. It's where you're crossing over, you're moving that side to side movement. Um, karaoke, right? Where they, you're kind of going front and back, front and back, front and back is a form of it. All of that's a form of braiding. It's where those legs aren't going in the standard normal function pattern. Uh, a lot of them are quick drills, right? And you got to watch out because crisscross will make you jump. Can they turn? No one's going to laugh at that. Okay, somebody laughed. Oi. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. Are they, are they able to run? If they want to run, are they able to run? There's a lot of debate right now in, like, Olympic sports and competitive running. Is it fair... 
and this is the this is what kills me. Is it fair for the normal abled person to race against somebody that's got prosthetics? So so who who is it not fair towards? The prosthetic person or the normal abled person? Right? This is the thing is the, but the thing is but there are people and this is funny I see normal able people saying it's not fair that they've got amp they've got prosthetics that help them run. They can run faster because they've got the prosthetic, right? And it acts like a spring, right? And I, I don't know where I stand on this. This is kind of a this is kind of an interesting topic that I don't know because some of those prosthetics, they really do provide them with an advantage. Right? It depends on the prosthetic, right? Some of those prosthetics are really, right, but there's a downside to it, right, Ashley? They have to learn how to rewalk. My thing is, if they've got that prosthetic and they're running competitively, let them run. Right? I mean, they've, they've taken a step that no one else has. Um, yeah, it's, it's kind of weird, though, isn't it? I mean, thinking about it, the wear and tear on their tissue is a lot greater. Exactly. I mean, the worst you have to worry about is maybe getting a foot sore. They have to worry about more amputation. Um, there was this, uh, it's funny is I was there, there was this huge debate on one of the military forums I'm on talking about, is it fair for a soldier to return to combat when they have a prosthetic because they don't have as much pressure on their feet as a normal soldier? Like, what are you guys arguing about here? This is dumb. Like the person had this foot blown off while being in the military. If they're able to get back to military service, let them come back to military service. It just, it's silly conversations we have like that, right? Um, now, when we start getting into those robotic limbs and stuff like that, now we start getting into, could they possibly have an advantage, right? Especially where we're going in the future. I mean, we start getting the cybernetics and more functional components like that. There's a possibility in the future that, you know, you lose your legs and they develop cybernetic components for it. Those legs may be better than a normal human leg. But that's way off in the future right now. We're not worried about Skynet taking over yet. Um, if I've got cybernetic legs, I'm more worried about somebody hacking my legs and making me like do the twist or something. Yeah, exactly. They have to put a metal detector, make sure you don't have fake legs. I don't know. By then, they'll be carbon fiber, not detectable. Um, vocational activities. What are they going to do as far as that goes? Specific hobbies, community outings. Can we help them with any of that? Gate training. I don't like this picture. Why do you think I do not like this picture? Yeah, therapist is sitting. He's so far away. Now, what if this patient is modified independent? Okay, maybe, right? He's social distancing. Um, maybe. The other thing I don't like about this, what's the patient not wearing? Gate belt, yep. This is one of those therapists, I'm gonna tell you. Why, exactly. I don't understand, this, there's so many questions I have for this. Unless he's working on maybe single leg balance with this patient. I guess theoretically they could be doing that in the parallel bars, but there are so many questions I have for this picture. Um, this is out of the book too, which is fantastic. There's so many questions, but I like how, you know, the therapist is really concentrated on the kid's foot feet and not watching the kid at all. No, I have not emailed the author about this one. I just kind of let this one go. So amputation and then prosthetic rehabilitation here, right? We kind of know what type of amputees we've had. We're gonna look at the prosthetic devices. They're gonna get initial eval. Um, therapeutic rehabilitation. They're, most patients that have an amputation are gonna be in therapy for quite a long time. Even if they're only coming once a week for a checkup or once every other week for a checkup, they need to be in therapy. Um, other aspects of therapy for it and then upper extremities. We talked a little bit about the different articulations already, right? So the main thing again, you guys need to know is what's the difference between a you know, a foot, a trans tib, and a trans femoral right now. Um, but be aware of that if you have those, where it's coming through, right? They, they will love to ask you about a trans femoral amputation 
And then in the answers, provide you answers that are about transtibial amputations. So there will be one that's a transfemoral amputation answer, and then the rest will be all transtib. So you have to be able to sort those out. So know the difference between transtib and transfem. There's a nice trans or hip arc disarticulation, right? They've got no hip at this point. Um, not, not the same as transpelvic, even though they're often referred to it as that. Transpelvis means that pelvic, that whole that whole innominate bone is removed, right? So one is removed of the femur, one's removal of the innominate. Uh, glute muscles are attached and usually attached to the adductor muscles. So the muscles are attached to muscle, right? Above the knee amputation, I have no idea what this guy's doing, but it's hilarious to me. What he's trying to do is get a flexion contracture. Uh, quad chest bone, it should be wrapped, posterior and attached. And various stump lengths will change potential for walking outcomes. The longer lever arm you have, the more of the femur you have left, the better the outcome for gait's going to be. Because the shorter and shorter you make that lever arm, the more and more you have to rely on the prosthetic. He looks exceedingly happy. And I'm not really happy with the way his foot's in return either, but anyway. So knee articulation we talked about goes right through the knee. And usually the gastric muscle of the hamstring will hold the cushioning in the knee. And they can either keep or remove the patella, depending upon what we're looking at. And trans-tib goes for the tibia. Good. A rotational plasty is a removal of part of the femur and tibia, saving the lower limb and rotating it 180 degrees for reattachment of the foot to the remaining limb. How many of you have seen that? He, he does look a little bit like Dr. Phil, I was going to say. How did you mention it? He does look like a weird Dr. Phil. Um, this one's a little weird one. I have yet to see one of these. Yeah, some of you are going, whoa. I have yet to see an amputation like this. Um, I'm kind of actually interested in ever seeing one. And I told Dr. Kelly that if he ever gets one for research, please invite me over because I want to see it. And Well, why would we do this? I, I don't know. Um, I'm guessing that it's easier to place that foot into a socket. The foot still pretty much functions. Um, I don't know why they do this. I tried Googling it and it looks like it's almost never done. And usually they're saying it's done for transfer when somebody's just going to be wheelchair and they're going to transfer with that, but I don't know how that helps them transfer. So I really wish I understood why you do a rotational plasty. Yeah, lower leg is functioning. Uh, I, I, I don't understand this one. This is just a weird one. And I, when I talked to Dr. Chitelli and he works with amputees, he's like, never saw this. Don't understand why they do it. Um, the only thing I can figure out is to keep the foot for whatever reason. Um, I don't, I don't understand it either. The knee is at the hip. You're exactly right, Jared. It, it's their, grab their short leg. It's their strong leg. No, no. You can even cut your own toenails. Okay, Ashley got it at least. I appreciate it. Grab my short hand. It's my strong hand. Give me your other hand. Uh, Symes are disarticulation. The main thing for Symes, anytime you see Symes, think no foot. Right? We talked about that already. Hip disarticulation, we talked that in formal, right? These are different types of prosthetic devices we can get based upon what we've got. We've got a manual lock and unlock, hinge mechanical, which is what we've got over here. Let me grab my little, my little annotator. All right, so this is typically a manual lock and unlock. There's gonna be a little button back here to push that unlocks it. This is more of a hydraulic knee here, right? It adds a little bit of shock absorption. And then you've got microprocessor knees and everything like that that actually have little computers in it that allow for the knee flexion extension. These things are expensive. Um, the different types of stuff you can get into knee, or, knee replacements when you had actual total knees and total hit or, you know, above knees or below knees, the stuff that you can get for this are, just amazes me nowadays. Um, there are microprocessors that you can have where if, if you do an isometric contraction of the hamstrings, it'll bend the knee. So there's some really cool things you can do with these nowadays um, to make them more of a functional foot, you know, or, you know, you turn the foot or you turn the leg a specific way and it dorsiflex the foot so they can get normal gait. 
Um, transtibials, we have different types of foots between blades and flex foots, right? Depending upon what we want them to do. Um, they may have microprocessors and electronic ones again, like this one over here on the far right. So it just depends. And the main thing here is understand with somebody with low socioeconomic status that's on Medicaid, if you have a foot replacement because you're missing your foot, what do you think type of foot you're going to get? So low socioeconomic status on Medicaid, cheapest available. You're exactly right, Alex. If they can give you a peg leg, they're giving you a peg leg. Right? If they're lucky and get it, you're exactly right, Ashley. Um, you know, they have to have a good chance for outcome in order to even get it approved. Because most time on Medicaid, they'll just tell you to put them in a wheelchair, which is kind of sad. So they're going to let take, honestly, I've seen it where Medicaid has approved a peg leg before. It just blows my mind. It was not really a peg leg, just a straight, you know, limb orthosis. Might as well be a peg leg, right? You got patients walking around coming down off steps. Initial assessment is going to have to look at the patient, type of aesthetic, outcome, all that from the PT standpoint. And the patient, we have to look what caused the amputation. It can be cheaper to get a wheelchair. You're exactly right, Jackie. It absolutely can be, right? But what do you think is going to be more beneficial for the patient, the prosthetic or the wheelchair? The prosthetic, right? Yeah, because they're going to be up and moving more with the prosthetic. Um, if the patient's got a diabetic amputation, what do you think a chance of them having another amputation in the future is going to be? Exactly, right? If you've got a patient that's got a Symes foot amputation, you should already be thinking in your head how to prepare them for a transtibial amputation or even a transfemoral because it's coming. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when or if they last long enough to get there. How long was the amputation ago, right? Who did the, who was the prosthetist? Who was their surgeon? Some of the surgeons in this area are really, really, really great with amputations. Some of them not so great, right? I would say if I am ending up having to have an amputation, this is time you need a doctor shop a little bit, right? So if any of you ever should need this or you have a family member that needs this, you need to go to health grades and look at the doctors that have had surgeries. You need to see, you know, what kind of outcomes they've had. Um, a lot of times, I'm, if I was a patient, I'd want to talk to somebody that's had an amputation by that doctor before. I want some comfort knowing that that, pa that doctor knows what they're doing. Where did they get their prosthetic? Do they have a prosthetic? Um, other comorbidities, right? Diabetes is a big one. But what if they've got something like complex regional pain syndrome? that can really cause a problem with amputations. We know they're probably gonna eventually develop phantom limb syndrome. Um, what if they just have hyperesthesia? We know that can cause problems. So we have to know what's, what's going on with them. You know, what if they've got you know, Parkinson's or early onset Parkinson's? That can cause problems. And then type of prosthetic we're gonna look at, what type of socket do we want? Are we looking at a suction or a Velcro lanyard? Are we looking at the screw? Are we looking at osteo integration? Are we looking at hip attachment? What kind of liners do we need? What kind of shrinkers do we need? Right, so the shrinker is going to shape the limb. The liner is actually gonna provide some support between the shrinker and the, the actual skin itself. Um, we may use silver liners again, because silver is antimicrobial. And how many socks is two socks? If it affects the fit of the prosthetic, that's too many socks. Right? So we may, the patient may be a three sock prosthetic today and tomorrow may be a five sock prosthetic, depending upon how swelling happens. The more they're up and moving, the more the swelling is going to occur. So they have to know that they may have to adjust the level of sock layers, right? So here's a suction one. When that goes on, it's literally going to suction cup up onto that knee. This is a lanyard one, right? So this is actually going to go up and kind of hold it up around the waist, right? Here's hi-fi, here's a pin. You can see the pin on the end of the foot there, right? Let me get my little drawer, right? So they see that pin on the end of that knee, that pin is gonna actually go down into the socket and allow for it to fit in there. Um, all of that's gonna come into play when you're looking at it. 
Where's my little, little eraser? There's my eraser. Osteointegration, do we have that pin going into the bone or not? That looks like a, the one on the, this on the right kind of looks like, it's like a grumpy old man's face. There's that, there's his eyes, there's his forehead wrinkle, and there's his nose. Anyway, that's what I see when I see these things. Um, what's used at the clinic for outcome assessments? There's the VR12, which is a standard assessment. There's LEFS, we can ask them. And the main thing is we need to know what's actually useful to the patient. We're gonna examine the stump itself, look at its healing, look at the muscle tissue and bony tissue, look for any scars. Manual muscle testing, it's debatable if it's useful at this point. If they've got a stretched out tendon, manual muscle testing may not even be a valid use anymore. We may have to figure out how they're able to more look functional than just tendon testing or manual muscle testing. With range of motion, again, we wanna avoid those contractures. So we wanna avoid contracting into what direction? What direction do we want to keep them out of? Into, out of flexion, into extension, yes. Um, there's this AMP Pro or No Pro, which are the amputee mobility predictor, right? With and without the prosthetic. Uh, Medicare and most insurances require this uh, specific testing to be done. It's usually done by the PT in order to order any new or existing prosthetic device. They'll have a K level of zero through four. So the K levels are here, relaxed. Again, I'm going to come over here. Where's my little annotate? These K levels are F, Y, I. These are not on your boards, but if you work in a clinic that deals with them, you will need to know what the K level means. So I put these in here in case you need them for your clinic. So there's K level one through four. The PAVET, the Patient Assessment Validation Evaluation Tools there, it's only ideal for K4, K3 and 4 trans tips. So common gait deformities, hip hiking and circumduction are probably the biggest ones you're gonna see. Maybe too lengthened stride on the prosthetic side, shortened stride on the sound side, decreased weight bearing, lack of hip extension, minimal knee flexion on the prosthetic device. I've got a bunch of videos I'm gonna be posting for all of those so you can kind of look at it. Uh, walking and running, can we get them to as normal gait as we possibly can? What type of assistive device do they need, right? Are they gonna be able to get back to work? Are they gonna be able to care for their family? If the patient's got bilateral amputations and they've got kids at home, can they care for their kids normally? These are all considerations we have to take into account. Um, type of seated activation we need. Learn to feel to react for feelings in the foot. The, seated, the seat is the seat of that socket. Are they able to weight bear into that position? Can they take perturbations? Right? Are they able to squeeze the ball between their, amputation, their legs and their amputation? Are they able to hold their hands in front of them? Are they able to hold a weighted ball in their hands? Are they able to stand on single leg on their good leg? So all of these things are gonna take into account because you gotta remember, if you add that prosthetic, you're adding weight to the prosthetic side and it can be hard to hold balance still. Oop. Practice sit to stands, right? Um, common compensations for this, kicking the sound limb back, only pushing through the prosthetic leg, kicking the prosthetic forward. We have to look at putting active pressure on the lateral hip in order to keep them standing up properly. I think this video kind of shows a common compensation. Let's see if the video works. It usually doesn't. I think, yeah, it's not going to work today. Of course not. Cannot play. All right, my videos aren't gonna work today. I'll put the video up for that. Um, weight bearing, can they weight shift? Can they find a normal set of balance? Can they find a normal set of balance with their eyes closed? Right, can they make circles with a tennis ball while they're in single leg stance? Can they do step ups? Are they able to do the wobble board? Are they able to do single leg stance? Right, so are they able to take that tennis ball while they're standing on that prosthetic and roll it around? Again, this is not putting full single leg stance because that other foot still got some attachment to the ground. They able to do wobble board activities. So this is simulating going up and down a hill. Are they able to have lateral perturbations going? What's their stride length look like? We're gonna have to look at all of this. This is just like we had, so the main thing here, when you're looking at gait with these patients, do they look like a normal patient, right? Are they able to do everything a normal patient's able to do? 
um, is weight bearing longer on one side than the other, right? So we have to be paying attention to this and working through the prosthetic side and the sound side, because sometimes they'll, they'll shorten one and lengthen the other or shorten the other and lengthen the other. Uh, are they able to ball kick? Are they able to do step throughs? What are their hip activations? Do we have to do um, biofeedback on their hip to get them to activate their hip? Can they sidewalk? Can they tandem walk, right? This does force more pressure through the foot and more of the center foot is, right? Do they need assistive devices, right? Do we need a walker? Do we need a cane? Can they walk with us? Can they walk with nothing? All of that's gonna come into play. Can they walk backwards? Backwards walking is gonna be really hard for most patients that are in prosthetics, especially at the very beginning. Um, can they walk backwards and sideways while catching a ball? Can they weave in and out of cones? Can they step over cones? Can they step over hurdles? All of this comes into play when you're working with these patients. Are they able to balance on an Eric's pad? Are they able to walk on a yoga mat? Because even though yoga mat's not that thick, it still has some cushioning. It can cause some instability in those limbs when they have a prosthetic. All right, let's see if my videos, of course, are not gonna work. They worked just a little bit ago. Can they lateral walk? Can they lateral cone walk? Can they pause and step over? There's hurdles. I ordered some of those because some of you wanted those for the balance thing, so I finally ordered some of them. Um, stairs. With a baloney amputation, you're able to do step over step with no hand assist because you still have a knee. If you have an above knee, microprocessor knees can do the muscle to allow them to do step over step, but it's usually very difficult. You can ride the leg up or down for step over step, but usually very difficult. Safest is to go step to step, meaning you're only going down one step at a time. Uh, most of us go step over step when we go up the stairs. We're going to go step, one step up, one step up, one step up. And again, a lot of these patients, we may have to teach to go up and down the stairs backwards because of this amputation. And I'm sure this video is not going to work either. No, of course not. Um, running. Do they throw the prosthetic limb outside? Are they really circumducting? Are they pushing off the sound limb? Do they have a throw and push? Do they integrate their arms? Do they lose arm swing by gaining the prosthetic? It's really common. They'll start focusing so much on normal gait, normal running with that prosthetic, they ignore their arms. And if they ignore their arms, what are they doing to their energy expenditure? Energy goes up, right? So we gotta be paying attention to that. Arms help us cut down because it helps with reciprocal gait swing. And not gonna work. Yeah, not gonna work, of course not. Got cool videos, but none of them work. I love it. I worked really hard on that and I thought I had them working. Uh, upper extremity amputees, shoulder and elbow are common. Mobilization is going to be big, soft tissue mobilization. Joint positioning is going to be big again in the upper extremity. Guess what position we're going to want them to avoid going into? With the upper extremity amputation. What do you think we want to avoid to prevent contractures in the upper extremities as well? Here's a hint. Flexion. Yeah, right? Um, most times, even if they've had a shoulder amputation, they've got the shoulder girdle still. So we want to strengthen the shoulder girdle, strength the pecs, the rear delts. All of those are going to come into play when we're working with these patients. Other aspects working with these amputation. Education, pain level. With an amputation, are they ever going to be 100% pain free? No. You know, let me ask this of you guys. How many of you guys are 100% pain-free today after sitting here for three hours? Right? I'm not pain-free. My ischial tuberosities are killing me right now. Right? We're almost done. So we need to explain to them pain is normal, right? Only whoever's falling asleep. That's, that's the other Mike. Mike's, Mike Plaza's out. He was out about 20 minutes ago. Hey, I, I can't see things, so I don't know what's going on. Um, but tell them, pain is normal. But when would we be worried about pain with a patient's in amputation? So you woke up 15 minutes ago, great. So you'll know to log out today. Um, what is normal for pain levels with the amputation? Or what, what level would you be find acceptable? What do you think? Okay, so under five, yeah, under five four, five, right? 
if they're in a four or five range, then I'm okay. They start getting up into that eight, nine range, I start getting a little worried, right? I'm worried that either A, they're actually in some serious pain, or B, they don't understand their pain. So we may have to work on that. Um, I'm gonna give you guys a link to a really great book because we're gonna talk about it when we do the pain neuroscience education. It's a really fantastic book if you can get to pick it up. Um, and seven up should definitely probably look good, Mike, right? The book is called, Why Do I Hurt? It's a pain neuroscience book that looks into pain. And some of you actually, I think probably would really get a lot out of reading it. I got a ton out of reading it and I've learned more about the way my body processes pain. Um, it's a really short book. Uh, I think it was like maybe a hundred pages. So even, you know, Ian right now could read it if he wants it. I was gonna say, it's, that's not long, are you kidding me? The book I'm reading right now is 574. Um, so we need to understand that fit of the prosthetics. This is not a forever prosthetic, right? So the prosthetics are gonna change over their lifetime. Um, limb and volume management, they're gonna constantly have to be managing their swelling and adjusting socks because of it. Communication, they need to communicate with not only us, but their prosthetists. If something's not fitting right, they need to tell us. Scar management, we need to limit pain and limit scar formation. How do we desensitize a scar? Touch it. You're exactly right. Move it. Do anything you can to get some feedback in it. Pick at it. Yeah, so exactly what you're going to do. Uh, emotional aspect of limb loss, right? So who is going to be more emotional about losing their limb? A single mother, a soldier, or just somebody that works on an assembly line? All. That's the thing. All of them right? We can't downplay any of them, right? And maybe the significant other, you're right. So that's the thing. We can't downplay any of them. All of them are going to have specific emotional losses we have to deal with, right? And they're not going to be the same. If you're working in military, the emotional loss from losing a limb is not necessarily the fact that they've lost the limb. A lot of them, I'll be honest, a lot of them are upset they lost the limb, but they're more upset they're not out with the rest of their unit than they are that they've lost a limb. They just want to get that prosthetic. They want to get back out. Mother, what's the mother worried about? Yeah, kids, right? They're worried about how to take care of kids, right? And then the guy that works on the factory line is worried about if he can get back to work. So they've all got emotional aspects dealing with that limb loss. So you've got to kind of rent. Exactly. Can I pay more? Some of you guys are worried about that now, and I'm sorry that you have to. Um, patient advocacy. This is an area that where we need a lot of patient advocacy. We need, pay, we need PTs and PTAs to step up and talk for these patients. Um, I highly recommend if you guys can go to the National Amputee Coalition and sign up for the newsletter. It is not a bonus point activity. Um, but sign up because you really get some really good stories on that. And it kind of lets you guys know because right now, let me just, you know, so today I cut off give you all a trans femoral amputation on your right side. Would that be catastrophic to most of you? Uh, it's a national, I have to look it up, Alex, let me look it up. Yeah, it's gonna be catastrophic for you guys, right? It's not something you're used to. Um, so you've gotta kind of think about that. You know, it's, it's definitely gonna be something that's traumatic to you guys. So you got to understand they have it. They need support as well. All right, that's it. Let me look up the National Amputee Coalition site real quick. Let's stop recording. There it is. You made it. You're done. There's the link to it. They have a newsletter. They have all kinds of things up there. Definitely look around their website. I, I found the first time I went to their website, it's really, really humbling. Um, it kind of tells you a little bit about what those patients go through on a daily basis. Um, and it's, it really... Um,
it really kind of makes you appreciate what you guys have. Also, I'm going to plug one company here as well, which is one of the companies in our area, which is Orth Orthotics in Motion. Um, they have some amazing, amazing things on the, I think this is the right one. I might've linked the wrong one. Let me make sure I did the right one. I think I linked the wrong one, didn't I? Oh no, well, they're good too. No, I did, that's the right one, okay. Um, definitely check them out. They've got some amazing stuff on their site as well. Orthopedic motion, there we go. Um, but just spend some time looking into these guys. These are patients. How many of you guys are interested in working with um, prosthetic patients and orthotic patients? I'm going to stop the recording.